Arnold from Somalia and all the world channels sending this, including NRK Norway. Stuck here, but now we understand what happened, and we have a picture back, and this is lying on all the kids. Here is Toby, and Toby, you made it, you even increased. Uh, Hello and welcome to the 2019 World Orienteering Championships. This is the arena. We are in the heart of the forest in Ursfold for the toughest discipline in orienteering, the long distance race. We're going to start today with the men's race. I'm sure you've probably been seeing some of the earlier starters out there on their courses. And then we will move on to the women's course at around about 4 p.m. local time. The two three times defending champions are here as favourites. Tova Alexanderson and Olaf Lundinez. Will they defend their titles or will we see new world champions crowds later today? Conditions are good for running, for long distance running and of course for spectating. Jonas Mertz is alongside me to provide some expert insight as we see the runners progress around their course. We will see the runners start in this arena. They will pass through the arena on their course and we will see them finish here. But Jonas, talk us through the long men's map. Yeah, as you said, we are in the middle of the forest here, so all the other distances will have the same arena. We start with a small loop here in this uh, northeastern part, and then three control three to four is actually the first very long route choice. Um, there are two of them. I think those two will be decisive. On the first one, we will have uh, like four different route choice possibilities. Uh, we have seen uh, until now that uh, all of them have been chosen from the runners. Mm. Then we have a loop here, down here in this area, and then the second, even longer route to control 11. Um, here it's not as... The, the route choices are not as given as on the first one, so it will be more about executing. Uh, do you want to go straight or more up to the path or the street? And then you have this uh, totally different area from control 11 to, let's say, 14. And then you go back to the arena, have a run, uh, an arena passage there, and we'll go up for the, out for the last loop, which uh, looks actually a bit more difficult since uh, there are not as many counters as before. It's a bit green, so if you're tired, you can actually miss there at control 20, 21. And then we will have a TV control at control 23. And yeah, then of course, we will go back to the arena. Yeah, of course, you can see like lots of different types of forest there, lots of different types of terrain, changing technique. And um, it's the FC26 controls, that's 16.6 .6 kilometers. And it was initially an estimated winning time of 98 minutes. But I think judging from the times we've seen already, that's gonna they're going to go I, much faster. I, I think there will be around 90 minutes, actually. Uh, we have already now the leader in 148, Toby Scott. Um, so I think we will go, let's say, somewhere around 90. Yeah, I think it's uh, a lot faster there and it's pretty dry out in the forest, to be honest. There could be, um, there is a capacity in Norway for lots of uh, wet marshes and everything, but it's actually uh, pretty uh, dry out there. It's a fantastic arena. As Jonas said, that we're going to be here for uh, every single race. So they've managed to build a good... Um, a good venue for people to go and cheer. This is uh, another look at the map, and let's have a look at some of these route choices you were talking about. Yeah, 
those are the three different routes I was talking about before. Um, I'm quite happy that uh, I'm quite sure about that we have some runners who are quite happy about uh, those possibilities. I didn't expect that because I thought uh, the Norwegian course planners they would uh, try to plan the course in a way that it will suit the Norwegians very well, so very much about executing in this kind of terrain. But there are route choices and you can run on paths and you can run a lot on paths here. So some of the continental runners will like that. Um, I actually think that the blue or yellow one is the best option here. I would even say that the blue one will be the best, but it's very hard to uh, to pick one, it's also hard for the course planner to say because when you're testing those route choices, you usually don't have uh, the very best athletes in the world testing it. So, and it's actually those runners who are the fastest when you run in the terrain. Um, so it's hard to predict, but I think the very in the I mean, it's in the beginning of the course. It's also for the runners difficult to say uh, how it is in the train, how, how tough it will be. So it's safest to go around. I think we will see many runners choosing a uh, route there, going more around, and I think it's fast as well. But And you can see here um, on the picture, the terrain is quite varied here. We have lots of these uh, smaller knolls, uh, some crags in there as well, some rock features. Uh, but it, it doesn't look like this the whole way around. There's no. such a big mixture. And of course, it's difficult to change because you have this long route from control number three to four. And then uh, there it's all about it pushing yourself very, very hard and just don't get lazy on the leg and uh, then you have to change your technique and you're running when you come to these uh, short controls with, with a lot of details. This is the second long leg. I Well, I think the route, they picked very extreme route choices here when they picked the blue one and the green one. You have some more compromised routes as well you can choose. I would, it, it would surprise me if uh, they would go as extreme as the blue or green one. Uh, for me, I can see a route which is quite similar to the red one, but a little bit on the right side of the line uh, as an option as well. But we will see. It's hard. This one is actually very hard to predict, and I think it's more about uh, finding the small micro routes on this one and execute it very well and distinct, uh, and not really about. Uh, I actually think if you pick one of these extreme route choices there, you would lose time on that. I, I would be surprised if it's the fastest, but I've been surprised before. And again, looking back at the variety of terrain here, this is uh, later in the course. This is in the last mm. few controls before you get to the arena. This, and is, this is actually there where I said it's, it's a bit more green and the visibility a little bit lower. Now, uh, not in this part of the leg. It's very close to 22, but around control 21, um, it's different there, it's flat, it's uh, when we compare it to control 7, 8, we have seen before, there are not as many details here. Um, we also have to think about it. it's in the end of the course, the runners start to get tired, so uh, this will definitely influence uh, like how they run it. And uh, If you get tired, you can do stupid things. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a long way. Those 16.6 kilometers, 530 meters of a climb. We, uh, of course, have had lots of runners already uh, out into the terrain. We've had about 17 finishers so far. Uh, any names you want to pick out here? Uh, yeah, we have actually one of the favorites. Uh, we have actually seen one uh, of the fastest runners right in the picture, Albin Riedefeld. Uh, one of the first names we really have to count in in this race. Uh, Kasper Foster, the junior, already out on the course as well. Uh, one of my guests for uh, a top 10 at least. And uh, for sure, I mean the Norwegians, even if maybe the course could have been planned a little bit more in their way. But uh, London S is the very big favorite for me. Then we have Magnadeli. Um, we have the Swiss, I wouldn't count them out, uh, Hoopman, Kibbutz, even though uh, Kibbutz has been injured uh, earlier in the se season. Gustav Bergman has showed that uh, in Finland that he is uh, yeah, in good shape. And uh, then uh, there's one name from Sweden, Emil Svensk, he has proven that he is in great shape right now. And uh, 
Also, I think the course could suit him very well. I would definitely have that name on my list and uh, Ruslan Gliba from the Ukraine. Yeah, there's uh, lots of uh, potential um, names that could feature uh, in this course. And especially, as you said, it's not quite as Norwegian as we expected, um, which might make it a bit more of a level playing field. This is Toby Scott, though. He's not very small. It's actually the chair who is which is very big. Yeah, the chair is huge. If you've seen the pictures on social media, they had to get a crane to lift the leader's chair into position. Anyway, Toby Scott, uh, two New Zealanders actually uh, in the lead currently. So they are 148.38. We're going to expect it to come down to around about 90 minutes. That's what we reckon with only currently 17 uh, runners at the finish at the moment. But um, lots more to come through those times, of course, will get faster and faster. We have those. Uh, the start list is determined by those who are uh, ranked highest in the world. And it's also a combination of uh, previous walk results as well. And here we have the Norwegian junior, Kasper Fosser. He opened the course very well. Uh, on this first three controls, uh, we have until the first TV control. He's in the lead there, 20 seconds ahead of Albin Riedefeld from Sweden. He really is attacking this course. I mean, no, uh, for sure, but you have to do that. I mean, uh, 20 seconds uh, in this starting field, I said it, we have many names up there, and uh, the beginning is not very difficult. Uh, there are no route choices. Um, so why, why should you start uh, slow there, or like uh, defensive? You have to be attacking from the very beginning, otherwise you will regret that in the end. Yeah, and especially for uh, somebody uh, like uh, Kasper Foster, who's starting a bit earlier and you know, needs to be attacking that course at this point. This is Emil Svensk, as you said, great results um, already this year, uh, taking that last leg at Yukola, uh, and uh, I'm mostly thinking about the test race in Norway. Test he, race. That was uh, very impressive, and uh, I, uh, I would be surprised if he wouldn't fight for the medals. So, of course, we have got tracking of the athletes and uh, they're mostly choosing to stay roughly on the line towards control number one. And, uh, this one, I think, is uh, it's unnecessary to go that much to the right there. You could keep quite straight, but uh, well, it doesn't really. You have to get into the technique, like the, the map reading. Uh, you might take some extra features in the very beginning to get some uh, self-confidence in the terrain, and uh, it's fast as well. Yeah, and the visibility is pretty good in this area. You can see, though, that open area, the section of bushes from quite a long way away. So even if you are like marginally offline or not directly on the red line, you can um, quickly correct yourself with, with no very few problems indeed it's uh yeah you can just see the open areas ahead and be able to run you know right or left of those or towards those as well you can see the tail here is 60 seconds so if you compare Emil Svensk and Albin Riedefeld that's already let's say 25 20 seconds there so that's quite the difference and uh, Svensk he will be at the First TV control, short while, he has uh, one, approximately one minute to go to the split. Yeah, so he's been pre-warned, so there we can see the time ticking down. Kasper Fosser, as we said, the current leader at that point, by an impressive 20 seconds for such an early point in the course. And you see, it's very open here. It's uh, good visibility, but still, it's tough. Um, have those blueberry bushes, and uh, might not be a problem in the beginning of the course. But if you have been running in this for like 90 minutes, then it starts, or not, it starts earlier. But it's it's going to be tough, and uh, especially since it's not the toughest part here of the course. And I mean, that's in this part of the course, you get the first impression. And now we have, you have to decide this route choice in the beginning. And you have to work with all the pictures you got from this uh, first three controls. And um, I think it's very smart of him to take time and read the map here and uh, make a smart decisions. He stayed for maybe, let's say, he waited for seven seconds. 
if he chooses wrong, he might lose a minute. So that's uh, a good investment there in the beginning. Yeah, it's worth it. And, and what, how will they go through the process of making the decision as to where to go on this well, First of all, I think they will be a bit surprised. Um, at least I would not have expected them to have a root choice where you can run several, like more than a K on asphalt. And uh, they will definitely see that there's an option more or less straight uh, through the ounce of out of bounds area or like between this this out of bounds area that there's one to the right and one to the left and then they will uh, try to see which one is the shortest by distance at least from the because if you compare asphalt with asphalt that's quite easy to decide and then uh, where you get the entrance uh, quite easily and stuff like that um, some of the runners who prefer to run in the or are very good at running and reading the details they might uh, have a preference at to go straight and some of them will uh, try to look for route choices around i think that's Vensk. and my feeling is that he will go around and to the right what do you think of uh, martin hubman's route here to number one going along the road it's very swiss yes <laughs> um i mean it's it wasn't. It, oh, it was slower. He lost time, definitely. But it can be important for him to get uh, up to speed in the beginning without uh, taking a risk to do a mistake. It looks actually quite. It looks doesn't look too easy because it's flat. It's a bit green. Um, you could do a, a. You don't really know the control there in in with surrounded by some green areas. How how does it look there? Um, it's easy to go around and there's no risk, but at l of course, I mean, he lost, let's say, 10 seconds. Um, and as you said, I mean, it's very open. It might be a bit unnecessary, but if it gives you a good feeling to the first control, there's nothing wrong doing that. Yeah, you mean to need to make sure you nail the first control. A lot of people will, will practice doing first controls, and if you, you know, if that's one that you make a mistake on, then uh, that could be your, you know, that's your race over. Not just the map from the amount of time that you've lost, but mentally, um, uh, just making that mistake too. But uh, Martin Hubman, it's his uh, first Forest event at the World Championships. He's only ever run the sprint and the sprint relay at Walk before, uh, so. Uh, uh, perhaps a different challenge for him. He'll be enjoying uh, the Norwegian terrain. Now we are for the first time at uh, TV control number two, control six. Jun uh, Aukrust Usmuen from Norway in the picture. We see that he is late compared uh, to Alvin Riedefeldt. And you can see between controls three and four, so that's the route choice leg. He he was about 45 seconds behind, then about two minutes behind, so uh, losing time uh, uh, on that leg. I don't actually know which uh, route he chose. Casper uh, Fosse was running around. I know that. Uh, he was pushing very hard, uh, as it seemed, on the GPS. Um, so at least the round seems to be a good choice so far. Here we have uh, the three of them, Riedefeld, Fosser and Usmoen on the way to control four. Uh, we see that Riedefeld is choosing to go very much in the terrain out and loses quite a lot of time doing that. Uh, Usmoen is going too straight down, losing time by doing this. And uh, then they're splitting up. Now it will be interesting to compare Riedefeld to Fosse, but uh, as we see, it seems to be quite much faster to go all the way around on the green route here. And uh, Usman and Riedefeld approximately the same. But of course, if you if you choose to go around, you have to p the you have to be pushing all the way and. It's very easy to get a bit lazy. Uh, you're running on asphalt. It's maybe not in the beginning, but uh, later on in the course. Um, it's more comfortable to slow down a little bit and uh, and not and for, like start reading other route choices. And then after that, you, actually, you, of course, you should do that. You, sh you should start to look at the 
control 10 to 11 when you get the time to do that. But uh, it's very hard after that when you go back to, you, when you decided something, that you go back and push as hard as you did before and it's easy to get lazy uh, already early in the course and then you lose a lot of time. And I think Kasper Foster, it seemed that he did that very well. Yeah, so looking again at uh, the start to control number one, see uh, again Martin Hoopman going along to the track. Hoopman, he lost, uh, you can say that, 38 seconds to the first TV control, number three. So that's quite a lot, actually. Yeah, early on. But we don't, I mean, he might not have lost all of the time to the first control. And then he might... You see, I mean, it's... Uh, we see Elias Kuka uh, doing a mistake there, or at least uh, he's not executing the leg very well, and he's losing much more time. So for him it would have been good, but if, on the other hand, if you want to be in the medal race, you have to you have to go straight there. Yeah, you have to make the root choices, and you have to execute. You, I mean, you, if you want to fight for the medals, uh, there's no such thing as saving up your uh, go for safety in a in a world championships race then you have to be attacking all the way because we don't we don't only have one big favorite here we have actually like seven runners who can win this race or ten, say let's say even 10 runners and then uh, you have to take risks yeah so 55 seconds down there kuka of finland Let's have another look again at Sir. And I want to pick out actually the way Casper Fossa exited control number yep. three and got to the road. He just overtook. He was the heading others. to the small path first and then down to the houses. Uh, seems that he is very distinct and he has a very clear tactic what he wants to do. He wants to hit the paths uh, to get uh, it as easy as possible out and then just push as hard as he can when he gets a chance to do it. I'm a bit surprised here that Hoopman is going uh, on the blue route. Um, I would have expected uh, the Swiss to try to get as much way on the paths and on the roads as possible. Well, you know, there is for her over half of the leg the opportunity to go on the road. Yeah, yeah, but, but you have also the half of the, is of not the leg with actually executing in the terrain and if you take the green route there is just the last part which seems to be very open and uh, quite I wouldn't say easy but you have to run up on the top and then follow the top and you shouldn't miss that control from there and it's not easier if you choose another route so it's I'm a bit surprised that he is uh, that he is choosing the the route well, very the much around to the first control, but not to the to the fourth. Well, I think he's gone round. Maybe he he's seen that as as a way around. It, whether he's not even seen the other way, or thought it was too long, or not expecting not expecting to have those opportunities to run round in yeah, this but terrain. If if we, ha I mean, we have seen Emil Svens taking time at the control. I think that's the thing you have to do. If he doesn't see the route to the right then he's doing something wrong because then he was just too nervous and too quick in his decision. Mm. You have to see, my opinion is that you have to see all the four mm. and then yeah. deciding which one you think is the best. And he should have had the opportunity to do that on that long uh, road run that he was taking to get to control yeah. one. Uh, Rudolf Cernis here. Best results from the long distance of the World Championships coming from 2017 when he was when he was 26. And this is the route uh, we've added in Rudolf Cernus here, the Latvian, to compare the routes they took. Most runners choosing to avoid that patch of open, which is quite uh, recently recently felled, quite uh, rough there. So also choosing to go around. Seems to be the continental route choice. A bit faster out in the very first part, but it seems it's approximately the same time to the first control. Um, 
See, it's pushing quite hard here to the second control. We can say that that control three, he is on third spot 25 seconds behind, so he's uh, 13 seconds faster than uh, Martin Hoopman to that control. Leonard Novikov, the Russian here, taking that silver medal at the Long Distance World Championships in 2017. Back in Estonia, ninth place last year in Latvia. So great long distance pedigree here for the Russian. Meanwhile, at the finish, Toby Scott, still our leader. In the very early, of course, parts. He's uh, actually able to, I think probably sitting there with Gene Beveridge, are both able to, uh, I think, watch some of the production on this huge chair. It's really not very comfortable to sit, sit there, um, I have to say. Uh, but they can cheer some of the other runners through the arena. And we have uh, the Austrian, Robert Merl. Already losing some time here, just uh, in speed. Maybe not very sure where he should go. Seems to be hesitating quite a lot. Yeah, you're thrown into this kind of vaguer part of the forest first. And yeah, you can just see that he hasn't quite got that much, as much confidence or as much speed. Yeah, it, it looks vague, but I mean, if you have the direction, you will get to this power line. Yeah. And uh, it actually, you, you could be attacking very, uh, uh, like, very hard to this point and then try to relocate it from there. There's no big risk doing that. Um, but you want to get a good feeling and you want to see many features in the very beginning. As you can see, he's already 30 seconds down. No surprise from uh, the GPS as well, slipping down. The rankings will probably be outside of the top 10 by the time he reaches control number three, which is the first uh, TV split, radio split, where we get uh, a uh, true indication of the time. Yeah, it goes into 11th place there. And it is, the forest is quite mixed underfoot and, and with what you can see visibility-wise, even just seeing him going through that, through that control there, uh, it is uh, quite mixed, but we are again back at uh, the start. Daniel Hubman about uh, to begin. He's got two gold medals from the long distance of the World Championships back in 2008 and 2009. But after a 10 year gap, can he uh, can he do it again? Well, he is one of those that could challenge uh, Olaf Linden as a favorite. I mean, if you have uh, more than 50% uh, rate on, the, on your medal rate in your Vok races, then you definitely have to we have to count uh, with him in this race. Um, he has a tendency to go quite straight. Uh, there's no risk that he will do that to number four since it's impossible to do it. Um, he will, my guess is that he will stay quite close to the line to control 11. Um, it will be interesting to see. Uh, how he will perform in his uh, 50th medal race. Yeah, 50th uh, race at the World Championships. Fantastic achievement. But just looking here, the live trackings were live with Martin Hoopman. And look at the distance he's got to go to control number four compared to the, to the synchronized GPS tracks of uh, Kasper Fosse and Emil Svensk. Yeah, and they have a very nice entrance there from this side. It's more green from the from the direction Hoopman is coming. Um, he will lose up almost two minutes, I think. Mm -hmm. One and a half, two minutes. And for that extra distance, you know, and only 150 meters Yeah, and there. the control is more difficult. This is Wojtek Knoll from the Czech Republic. Yeah, 13th in the long, the long distance the last time out. Uh, best results coming in the sprint. Mm -hmm. Fifth position yesterday in the qualification for the middle distance. 
That's quite an interesting thing this year. We will have more runners okay. running all the disciplines here, since we don't have the sprint and the sprint relay. You don't have to focus on anything. So it might be even a bit harder to win it or to be at least to be top 20 this year than uh, in other years. Yeah, all the, uh, the top athletes are running this long distance. Those we don't have, we don't have like some Eskashinabe either. Let's have a look though quickly at this, uh, these routes. We see oh, Emil Svensk is missing the control and that's, it's hard to say, let's say 20, 25 seconds he lost there. And uh, I mean, you are pushing so hard on this leg all the way uh, until the last, let's say, four or 500 meters. And then you have to switch and go back to orienteering. Um, which is quite hard to do, and unfortunately here you don't have many distinct features to read at, so you have to be very careful with direction, and uh, you might be quite tired uh, from the running part. Your brain is not working very well there, so it's, that makes it even harder. And then uh, things like this uh, happen quite easily. Well, we've he, already... He, he, it would have been good for him to really go up on the top of the hill there mm. to get the overview how how big is the distance to the eastern part of this hill like when it, when it's going down it's that he gets an overview over the situation now it it felt that he was attacking very hard he got up but not really all the way so he didn't really get the overview well, I wonder if he thought he was actually he, if he thought he was on the top of the hill just from the way he came down because they're only um if there are any form line contours, like, so he could have thought when he was going in the re-engine that he was going yeah, through the he hills, and then that's why he's drifted off west he's when he went to that thing again. Ah, yeah, we've seen a we've seen a lot of the earlier starters make a mistake on number five and simply go too far down the slope. They've got to be able to judge that the uh, gradient of that slope, and that will have those warning bells, those alarm bells going off in your head to know you're too and low. And now, ah. talking about alarm bells, <laughs> the distance is very big as done now, and it's just continuing. I think now he thinks that he is on the hill just in the, under the, the like the, the ring, the circle, and uh, heading down to the control. There will be a spur there as well to the left, but uh, I don't really understand. He's still attacking very hard, now he stops there. And uh, I don't want to be a pessimist, but well, if you would like to win a medal, uh, that's almost two minutes now compared to Kasper, or it is two minutes because he has to go back. It's almost three minutes. Um, that's just too much. Yeah, that is too much. We're going to see him at control uh, number six. We have another TV uh, point as well. But Tonchon, uh, he's uh, just setting off into the forest. And only a few more now to begin their races. Tonchon, more of a sprinter, but also got... Uh, I mean, he has... Uh, historically, more of from a sprinter, the longest, I think. But uh, he's definitely one of the runners who will uh, have a good feeling about uh, the course when he picks up the map and sees that there are options around. Um, there are other runners who will have the same feeling as well. I'm thinking about uh, Matthias Kiburts, for example. Um, maybe the Czech runners, mostly the runners from the continent, they like, of course, you have the, those kind of route choices very often there. And uh, it feels... It gives you a good feeling if you can do stuff you have done in your home terrain a lot. A lot. And um, so can uh, well, it will be interesting to see him in on this course. Well, this is a uh, Daniel Hubman here on the tracking that we have there. Again, as we might expect, go very straight route, but didn't quite have the speed. He was uh, actually, I mean, not running like straight on. He was kind of wiggling a bit on the line, not going exactly straight the whole way. But so if we're live with him now, uh, within touching distance of uh, Svensk and Fosser. Yeah, Emil Svensk, uh, 8 minutes 45 to uh, control number three. So Hubman there with that tail being only 60 seconds, uh, with uh, yeah making good 
uh, progress here, especially as we've seen that mistake there from Emil Svensk. Of course, uh, the Swiss are some of the most vocal supporters with the fan clubs uh, always turn out to the World Championships to give them some support. This is Daniel Hubman, though, in this uh, new Swiss kit with the white shoulders coming through. Uh, very soon he will be at control number three. This is uh, number two, where they already have a drinks point. He is already drinking there. Uh, they have drinks points about every 25 minutes, I think, on the, the course. And just, you know, he's, you've got to... You've got to know how to pace this. Of course, he's very experienced. All these guys now running here in the later end of the start, they, they know how to pace a race such as this one. But you can see he's already slower than uh, Emil Svensk at this point, and will probably go slower than Kasper Foster as well, as he will come across the control very shortly. You can see him looking around just looking for the good micro routes, choosing any opportunity he can. And now he has this long distance, this long leg. We'll see, starts to move away from the control. It would be interesting to see like how long he, he took to uh, make that route choice there from control three to four. Now we are back uh, with Emil Svensk on the way to split to control six. So uh, I want control Five to the end, and he was uh, one minute behind at uh, control four, and now it's more than five minutes. And uh, as I said before, that's too much. This is Martin Hopman. He is on the way to control six, where we have seen Svensk before. So we still some meters to go. Great pictures from our running cameramen here and you can see what, just what the visibility is like in this part of the terrain. goes into seventh place. Yeah, and um, he lost a lot of time on this uh, route choice when you've seen him taking one more to the east. My guess is that he lost about two minutes there. Yeah. And also, uh, the he would not have been saving energy as well. He'd be using a lot of energy in that process as well. I mean, he saved the energy to the first control. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Vojtek Kral from Czech Republic, now on the way to the first split, control three. So, like, around 40 seconds left. Um, a bit less. Yeah. The best of the Czech athletes at the moment. I think Miloš Nikodim has had some injury problems this year. So expecting uh, after he won that uh, World Cup race in uh, the Czech Republic at the end of 2018. So Kral, the best of the Czech hopes. And just coming now into control number three. It's quite a good start. Let's see, he's, he's stopping uh, now as yeah. well. Actually, I'm a bit surprised that he isn't stopping at the control, because it might be that he's taking some steps into the wrong direction when uh, mm. leaving the control before having decided the route choice. Yeah, and, and then walking off in that direction might influence his route choice, which then might be the wrong one as a result that he's uh, gone that way. Here the standings though, control number six, Kasper Fossa still with that great start. Let's have a look and see how that was done. This is uh, Daniel it's Hubman. Martin oh, it's Martin Hubman, sorry. Yeah, he's number 64 and Daniel Hubman's number 70. Mm -hmm. And let's see if we can tell just what's uh, a gap. Uh, or what time Martin Hoomin has lost on this different route choice here. You can see 
Kasper Foster taking great speed through on these tracks. And then just now when he goes, when he leaves a track, that's quite a short distance to actually get to the control. Uh, Martin Hoodman has to find some nice tracks, maybe alongside some of these streams, alongside uh, some of the larger crags there in uh, the bottom of between some between some of the hills. And yeah, look at that. So the tail is three minutes. Um, yeah, that's uh, yeah, almost three exactly minutes. three minutes. And we have seen at control six, Hoopman is three minutes and ten seconds behind. So that's the whole difference. Yeah, and he was 26 seconds behind uh, Emil Svensk earlier on. Here is uh, another of the favourites for today's race, Magda Dali. Uh, he is one of the uh, last few to start, not last but five to start, and some high hopes on Magna Dali, who's had some impressive results this spring, especially uh, compared to Olaf Lindenes, who has had some injury uh, problems this spring. Maybe now getting uh, back to some shape, we will have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, he. Um, Heading out into the forest, and Graham Griswold actually has just come into a new leading time by five minutes 39 seconds. So, Graham Griswold of Great Britain uh, back now uh, on the team after quite a tricky year last year with some injuries. Uh, he's going to be a big part of the World Championships when they come to Edinburgh in 2022. So, yeah, you can see that lead by five minutes. Hopefully, Graham is pretty satisfied with his race. He went, I think, one of the middle routes on the first long leg. Here's Frederic Tranchon, though, of France towards split number one. So walk towards controls two and three. Our camera round struggling to keep up with him as he really attacks this course. He'll be coming up this uh, slope into the terrain. And it'll be interesting to see what he does as he approaches this control. So begins to make his decision before he's even punched exactly. the control. And that's, as you said before, uh, the first steps won't influence his decision. And uh, he was prepared uh, to do that. So he was very aware of what's coming uh, to the next control. I think that's very good. Yeah, even very if he good. didn't have the opportunity to make his decision, he knew that there was a decision to be made. Yeah. And I mean, he's stopping, so he's aware of that he hasn't done the decision yet. Sometimes you think that you have done the decision, but you haven't been looking carefully on the map. Okay, so let's look at these trackings. We've got Tranchon in there, we've got Glibov as well, who's on his way to the split point. Kral, you can see, went round the road to Tranchon. What has he done here? I think yeah. maybe he's sticking on I mean, that's track. what I talked about. You just you should just take direction and then you will get the power line um, to help you. But he didn't lose that much time. That's uh, surprising. And Kral was, I think, first to control number one. He was very fast going on that track ahead of Fossa. And yeah, Kral went into second place at control number three. So ahead of Kasper Fossa, only 10 seconds behind Emil Svensk, who we know has made a, a four minute error at control number five which will be pretty much his race over. So uh, good early start. And Kral, maybe that uh, route choice paying off. There's only a few seconds. It's, it's so difficult for the, um, the call setters to be able to know which of um, the routes is the quickest because, you know, of course, they're not able to test anything with the fastest runners in the world. And uh, we will, I think, have to wait and see for the very last starters mm. to see what their routes are on those longer legs and see if we can determine then actually what is the best yeah, one. We, have we simply don't We have seen really that many know. times when we were in Finland, uh, the course setter, course planner said that there's no option to go around. And then we have seen uh, Joey Hadorn uh, running an incredible time uh, on the route choice around. Uh, we have seen that many times. We have seen that in Norway uh, last year when they thought that uh, there's an option to go around, but there actually wasn't because it, it's so hard for, for a course planner to test it since you don't have, you can't let the best runners test it because they will run it. Exactly. Ruslan Glibov here, defending his walk long silver medal from last year. Uh, one O-ring and overall this year as well. 
So got some good form. Goes uh, joint second there with Corral. And uh, moving quite quickly, maybe he's already made his choice or maybe he's trying to make his choice as he uh, just takes that exit from the course. Here's Casper Fosser. Hard to say where he, where he is. He's somewhere in the forest. Uh, he's pre-warned to control number 15. 15 so yeah. he'll be around the like controls 14, 15. So after that uh, second long leg into some more controls that are close together where runners, I think, are going to expect uh, probably to see some cameras. That's probably control 14. So now into another short one to control 15. There's a big mix of uh, a longer and shorter legs. There aren't as many uh, like middle distance legs as in, you know, maybe. That's because it's a long distance. distance. Well, <laughs> you know what I mean? But legs of, uh, you know, somewhere between a really short and really long, um, you know, distance between each of the controls. But Casper Fosse, yeah, again, look at this uh, gorgeous terrain we have here. Uh, varying all the way through and actually looking pretty fast here. So Casper Fossa is going to set the new fastest time here. Still seems to be going well. So 67 minutes of running goes six seconds, six minutes, sorry, faster than Graham Griswood, who is our leader at the finish. We also had Artis Pullins from Latvia. He's the one chasing Casper Fossa. We'll have a, a difficult job if he's going to try and stick on with him there. But let's have a look now at some of the route choices to this long leg mm -hmm. control uh, 10 to 11. And that's uh, interesting. He chose to back out from the control. That's something we don't see very often. Uh, it's not the easiest in your head to decide uh, and go for a route where you have to run in like 180 degrees the wrong direction first. Uh, but then you have a very nice track there all the way out. It's very hard to say if it's fast or not. Of course, it's not. We were talking about this option yesterday. Um, it is an option. We knew that before, but I don't know if it's the fastest. We, we have to wait until we see the very best runners go straight there. I mean, I, I don't want to say that Foster is not one of the very best, but we don't have anyone to compare him. Yes, that's true. That's true. We need to get uh, more of those faster runners to be able to compare. And on that leg, there's, there's a lot more, yeah, as you said before, micro route choices that they can, they, they can take on that one as uh, on the first long leg, they're kind of forced around the section of uh, out of bounds. Magna Dali here on his way to split control number one. And we're very soon we'll have all of the runners out in the forest. So Dali here will be uh, not the fastest. He's late there. He is late as the seconds tick by. He's not as quick as Casper Fosser. And um, I mean, it's it. I don't. It would be interesting to see why he's late. Because if you, if he's just maybe a, he chose a little like a bad route to the first one where he lost some seconds. Or uh, but I mean, it's for your. It's mentally a, a difference if you did a mistake. Yeah, he had decided the route choice before, but it's mainly a, a difference if you did a mistake or if you just lose, because if you just lose time executing the route you chose, you don't notice that you lose time. But if you do a mistake at one of the first controls, that will get stuck in your head and you will have it with you if, if you want or not. Um, but it looks that he's just not attacking as much as uh, Casper Foster is doing. Yes. Yeah. No, no mistake there. He looked like he was a bit slower in at the uh, beginning, maybe a bit, a bit higher up the slope. A bit much to the west there to the second control, but not a, that's not a big mistake. And here we have uh, Matthias Kibbutz from Switzerland. He had a lot of he had, uh, got injured at the test run in Norway. Uh, he wasn't. He was sure that he will be back for the World Championships uh, already then, but he wasn't sure about the shape and he uh, wasn't sure about the shape until the day before yesterday. <laughs> I tried to get some information, but he said uh, he's keeping it as, as the hockey players are doing. I don't uh, tell you anything about the shape or my injury, um, but he, 
He did very well yesterday. He won his heat in the qualifications. So um, that's a good feedback. And the same for him, as I said about uh, Tronchon. He will be very happy about the route choices because uh, I also talked to his coach before. Um, it will give him self-confidence to see that, okay, I don't have to run all the way in the terrain. I have a chance to do two kilometers here and just run. I'm good at it. And uh, uh, one runner who won't be less happy about that uh, because he's very, very good in the terrain is uh, Gustav Bergman. Yeah, he uh, took all the medals at the uh, World Cup in Finland. But here is a final starter. Look, you can see there three uh, gold medals well, in a row. He's got five gold medals in the long distance. Three in a row. Can he make it four in a row? Take a look now at the start. He used to be very, very attacking already on the first two or three meters, and he gets the map. There's no hesitating usually, and I don't think it will be today. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> very, very aggressive off the start. There are two the runners end. doing that. It's uh, him and the Johan Drunesson. And looking very detailed, collab uh, catching those few second glances at uh, each of the at the map, but knowing you know he can get a couple of seconds just on this run out to the start. Very, very aggressive in the, the forest. He is the last starter, so Olaf Lundanez will be chasing the rest of them uh, around the course. And the Norwegians who are here, there's, there's been a spectator race earlier this morning. They're hoping that they're going to be able to cheer on a uh, Norwegian victory today. Let's have another look, though, at this long leg from three to four. Now we have Daniel Hoopman here, so it's not the same Hoopman as before. Not as good in executing the route out to the road there as Kasper Fosser. We see that Manedali is going to the south, which we have seen isn't a good option. But here's Hoopman. Yes, Daniel Hoopman here. Three warns at control number six, crashing through this terrain. <laughs> The we're not, we're not sure which of the the routes he's taken through on the the long leg. We saw he wasn't as mm. as just as quick out of control number four, but uh, at control five there. So you see control four. He was uh, almost a minute behind, 55, 56 seconds. But losing 30 seconds on that long leg, we can see yeah. from 26 down to 56. And I mean he lost already. 15 seconds, 10, 15 seconds, just on the way out from the control. That, that was very impressive, uh, how aggressive and focused. And uh, you really got the feeling that he had planned every meter of this first part of the route out from, from the control to the road. Uh, talking about Casper Foster, of course. Mm. Uh, see, it was very distinct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think that's that good orienteering. Yeah, and I think that. As much as the route choice itself it is going to put him in, in actually the best stead. Hoodman, though, goes uh, second 41 seconds slower than Fossil. So actually, he's caught up a little bit of time there between controls four and control six, looking mm. very aggressive. Oh, this that looks like tripping over one of the cam uh, camera cables there. Flying into the picture. <laughs> Matthias Kibbutz. And that is control number two as he picks up the water. He's been pre-warned at our TV point in control three. Let's see if we can catch up with him as he comes up the hill. There he is on the right of picture. He's going now to control number three. Interesting. We have seen both uh, Hoopman and uh, Kibbutz drinking at the second control already. Seems to be a Swiss thing. And, and Kibbutz uh, not stopping there after control number three. It's a good start for Kibbutz. Almost as fast as uh, Emil Svensk. Yep, just six seconds slower. Let's have a look and at how he uh, did it. Well, he will take every chance he gets to find some asphalt. And looks like fastest there into control at number one. We don't have Emil Svensk though on that uh, on our GPS tracking. He uh, making a mistake uh, down at, at control number five. So it looks as if he would go, I mean, the, the way he ran away from Control 3, it looks as if he would go for the one uh, we've seen Casper Fo Fosser going. It's a bit early to say. 
So Emil Svensk still leading at control number three with only a few athletes, only Gustav Berman and Olaf Linden has yet to reach that point. Six seconds, 10 seconds down, quite close at the top. So all of those guys still in with a chance. Berman here has been added to the mix. The Swede in the uh, the brown. Let's have a look and see what uh, he does as Kubertz, of course, heads straight for the road. But Fossa and Berman very close together. You can see they've taken, it's almost as if they were running together. They're not, of course, this is a synchronized replay. Uh, and let's have a look and see who does the best as they head into control number one. You can see that uh, Berman is trying to get the features. He was running up a bit there to get uh, the cliff and then he's running around the green area, got the stone and in there. So he was very, it seems that he had a plan as well there. Uh, executed it well, and that's uh, one thing I meant uh, by saying that he's very good uh, when he's running in the terrain. Uh, he always has a plan and he's very good in executing it. So on his way to con from control two to control number three at the moment. We'll see what his time will be. He's going to be in contention in amongst uh, those top few runners, just a few seconds separating them. That's pretty much nothing at this part of the race. And it will be interesting to see what he is doing on this uh, route before. We have seen uh, in earlier races that he sometimes, um, I mean, it's it's very clear that uh, he doesn't really like this those routes around very much, where you have uh, not only a few meters, but kilometers on asphalt. And sometimes you get the feeling that he is getting a bit in a, in a stress, stress situation when uh, and you have to choose something like that and then that he is choosing routes he wouldn't really choose when he could uh, like when he would run a training only and I think now he's going to the south as we have seen uh, Martin Hoopman and uh, Magne Daly at least uh, like when I look at the direction he went out from the control and uh, there you have a lot of running in the terrain, so uh, we'll see. Maybe it goes around. But you could see on his way into control number three, from control number two to number three, he was really uh, intensely looking at his map and, and a, a, you know, a bigger part yeah, of the map to make I mean, that decision and just either, either checking it in the last part and parts before punching control number three and moving on. Either you do it like that or you, you stop. stop. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got to weigh up going slower from control two to three to make that decision or you know, losing the time after you punch control number three just by stopping. It will be interesting to see what London S will choose from control three to four. It's, it's so easy to think about him as the runner who doesn't like to run on uh, past and asphalt, but at the same time, he won the world championship long distance in Switzerland as well. I mean, if you win there, um, you don't have to be worried about running uh, route choices on tracks. Yes, but in in Norway, he's going to be expecting that the fastest route will be straight. Um, Gen yeah. Generally. Yeah, I mean, you would expect, I, I would have expected, I mean, when I saw the course yesterday, I was very surprised about the course planning because I would expect them to plan the course as that it suits the Norwegians as much as possible. That's the thing I would do if I would plan a course in Switzerland, uh, at uh, for sure for the Swiss runners and not for the Norwegians. Um, but this course actually, and then you, you could do that in the forest and you could uh, set the course, um, where you many long legs and a lot of map reading, reading details on the way and executing. But this course is, but you will have two decisive moments and that these are the two routes, the long routes. And in both, on both routes, you have to cho like the possibility to go and run on asphalt. And I didn't expect that. And so I why do you think, why do you think the core setters have done it that way? Well, as I said, I, I'm surprised that I do it in Norway, but I think that the course gets better when you have actually route choices and different possibilities and 
when it's not all about executing. I mean, here you have one of the routes is more about executing. It's the second long route. And the first one, you have four options, and you pick one of them. And you have both, and I think that's very good course planning. But I'm expected that I did it, because it's obviously not the thing that I would have picked knowing that my big runners are London S and Magnadelli. Which I don't mean that they're not good in doing that, but there are many other runners as good as them doing this, and there are not many other runners as good as executing a long lead in Norwegian terrain as they are. Well, Olaf Linden is 14 seconds down on that lead by Emma Svenskis of Berman in uh, only four seconds down. So two Swedes leading with all the runners then through control but number three. It's two Swedes leading, but I think we can count, we can count out Emma Svensk. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately. yes. Uh, he made that four minute mistake to control number five uh, and losing a bit of time on control number four as well with just a mistake uh, on the slope in that vague uh, area. Uh, and then look, even you know these top 20 within uh, a minute of the lead at uh, this very early stage you know they haven't been uh, tested uh, to the full extent of this uh, tough course uh, by control number three and of course we're going to see those bigger time gaps opening up uh, after they do some of those longer legs by the time we see them through the arena and when we see them through some of the other split times as well. So now we have uh, Kasper Foss, uh, Daniel Opman and Ruslan Glibov. And we see that Glibov is going for a uh, middle route choice there. That's an okay option. It's slower. I mean, he lost a minute, a bit less compared to Kasper Foster. But um, say it might have been that he would have lose, lost some seconds as well if he would have chosen the same route. So it's, it's not as good as the one around, but it's not as bad as... Again, well, we yes, saw him before. that he lost uh, a few seconds just getting out onto yeah. the road. Again, like that's where Casper Foster has done such a good job. And people are losing seconds even at that point as well. But I think, yeah, I think that route choice, I think he lost too much time there. I don't think um, necessarily that's somewhere where you can lose a race if by making that choice. Or at least it doesn't seem so at the moment. So Glibov goes fourth. Yeah, and interesting to see here, we have uh, Elias Kuka from Finland. He was after three controls, he was uh, 55 seconds behind. Here it is, uh, 117. So he only lost 22 seconds compared to Kasper Foster. And we know that Kasper Foster was executing the leg very well. So good job from the runner from Finland, Elias Kuka. And Wojtek Kral as well. He will have lost about 50 seconds between controls three and six. Uh, Tonchon is also up there. Rudefeld two. With uh, so Ruslan Glibov just passing that point. So we will really begin to see what the best route choices are as uh, some more of the later starters make that uh, point. And then you know we see really see here. With the, those top 20 at control uh, three, they were within a minute of the lead, now down to uh, four minutes uh, of the lead. Toby Scott there, still a good time uh, from the Kiwi, uh, four minutes down. He's currently in fifth place at the finish. And Emil Svenska, you know, you have to point him out, unfortunately, with that five uh, minute deficit into 26th place at the moment. Four minutes of those were lost uh, at control number five, where he just headed too far down the slope and, and, and kept going for, for quite a long way before he realized where he was, when he'd gone too far. It showed a bit what he was going for. I mean, he was, he was attacking very, very hard and um, for a very long time. And you could, expect him to notice that uh, that the there's something wrong with the distance at the same time when you're 
attacking very hard. It's like you have to, in some way, focus on your attacking and believe in what you're doing and, and in your self-confidence. And either you go for the medal or you, you don't. I mean, he missed the control with, let's say, 20, 30 meters and just pushing too long. And in the end, it would have uh, a pity if, had, if he had missed the, the medals with some seconds as well. And then he would say, yeah, why didn't you push more? And well, he was going for the medal. He missed the control. I hope he will uh, he will come back for the middle distance and show us what he is able to do there because he is in great shape. Yeah, he really is. It's about that that fine uh, task of going on the balance between uh, pushing it really hard and uh, and playing it safe and making sure you don't make a mistake. And now it's interesting. We have Monedali here. Going to the south, we know that uh, Martin Hopman lost about three minutes on this route here. Dali won't lose. Yes, he loses yeah, he about, about three minutes. Yeah. So that's a tough start for Magna Dali. Yeah, and look, you can see Casper uh, Fosser fastest on that leg by 45 also seconds. So interesting. To control seven, we see that Hoopman is uh, going straight and Kasper Fosse more to the north, avoiding the green areas a bit. Now in the picture, Magne Dali. So yeah, three minutes lost then from controls uh, three to four. And we're going to be able to get uh, that time check. You can see that he was. So maybe two minutes, OK, lost uh, between three to four. Yeah, quite exactly two minutes. I don't think it was synced that uh, when they left the control, so it okay. was uh, an actual replay and yeah. not the same. Yeah, so he'd but already still, lost the It's seconds. almost three minutes here, and we see uh, he is. I mean, he has to fight from, let's say, position 14, back to the medal places and. Uh, there are no blueberries <laughs> up there, so it's it's hard to get to fight back the, the place. I'm sure he will. He obviously has the chance to fight his way back to top ten, top six. But it was very hard to fight uh, your way back into the top three. Yeah, I think once you've made that decision to go south out of uh, out of that control three to but four, that's two to three minutes lost immediately. Yeah, and we have another long leg, and I mean. Runners who dis decided for the right route this time can uh, choose the wrong one next time. And we no surprise here, Kibbutz going for the straight uh, for the route around there as well. A bit more straight here, I like that. Trying to get go up on the hill. Um, I don't know if it was planned by Casper Foster to get uh, to see this path there. It's always a bit of risk to head for something which is lower. And, um, and and like the end of a path is not not the easiest to to hit, but he did it well. I mean, he didn't do a mistake to the control, but still, it could have been closer to the to the straight line from where he left the path. Gernot Imsien, Kerschbaumer, on his way to the second split at the first TV control. He was 38 seconds behind on position 13. And you can see they already over a minute uh, down on the leading time. Still held by Casper Fosser. And uh, talking about Casper Fosser, I think he will come to the finish very soon. Yeah, he has made it to control and number with Very soon, I mean within five minutes. So we're going to look out for him. I'm sure we will catch a glimpse of him at the finish uh, with all the Norwegian interest in these races, of course, on home soil. And Kasper Fosser, the uh, junior world champion in the long distance in, in very different terrain over in Denmark. But, uh, Imsen Kirschbaumer going into joint eighth place, nearly two minutes down. And very shortly to this control, we will see uh, Matthias Kibbert. And Kibert. here we have him. So here is, uh, I 
think what is quickly turning into a big chance, big possibly even medal chance for this uh, youngster, this Norwegian youngster. He is still a junior and he's had, uh, was able to win the long distance at the Junior World Championships last month in Denmark. He's had a fantastic race here today. He's still leading at our second TV point. He's still leading at control number six. So what a great, great run here from Kasper Fosser. And the Norwegian fans are very duly getting excited to cheer their man into the finish. He had a fantastic start to the race. Of course, we're going to see more of his route as the rest of the runners go round. But a brilliant run here from the junior. He's going to take the new leading time by 11 minutes. And I think Casper Fosser is going to have a long sit in this leader's chair, this huge green leader's chair, as he goes all the way to the line and crosses his time 91.48. I mean, this is just amazing. This is very impressive. He is, uh, he's still a junior. We usually see juniors doing some mistakes at, at, at one point in the race, or we don't see many juniors being able to push very hard for 100 minutes or 90 minutes in his case, 91 minutes. He's more than two minutes faster than the estimated winning time, which we actually said would be a bit faster, but I would almost guarantee a top 10 here. I would almost guarantee a top 6 even. Um, well, of course, we haven't seen him, how he, how he was doing on the long legs, but and on, it and on feels some of the short legs very, the last very, loop. very fast. And this is, just, this is just amazing. I mean, everyone was talking about him being a super talent, uh, having a chance to be top 10, but that puts up a lot of pressure on you on home soil and he's just going out. He was even quite relaxed before the start. He was standing there, waving into the crowd, uh, having a chat to the people at the start, and then just heading out, doing his thing. He was there at the first TV, at the second TV, and, well, let's see if uh, he might uh, get uh, some kind of cash because he will be sitting on this uh, chair for a long time. Yes. As you said, it's not very comfortable there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it isn't very comfortable to get there. And this, uh, with Fossa in the, the green, is one of the reasons why he's doing so well. But Gustav Berman, in fact, he was the only one faster than Fossa out of control number three. And let's have a look what the route choice is like yeah. into control number four. Fossa still leading, and the reaction from the Norwegian crowd as they see that. So Berman, we're going to see very, very shortly and, and 28 um, seconds slower on that leg three said, to four. I Here's mean, we seat. have seen Glibov, I think, taking the same route, but he was not as good as Benjamin on the last 500 meters. He was staying on the path very long, and Benjamin is so good in just doing orienteering all the way. I mean, there is no small mistake on his route, and uh, I don't think that anyone else would be able, yeah, maybe Lundenes would be able to do this route as good as Wehrmann was doing it. And he was almost as fast as Kasper Foster on this part. So the time ticking, he's going to be later than Foster to punch that one second in it. One second between the new leader at the finish yeah. and Gustav Berman. Wow. And to be honest, if there was one part I was a bit afraid uh, when I was thinking of uh, Gustav Berman's performance, then it was this route to control number four, because he, if you, he would have picked the one to the south, there would have been a risk that he lost a lot, would lose a lot of time. But uh, from now, it's... Uh, the course, I would say, it suits him pretty well. And you can see uh, Lindenez and Berman pretty much taking the same route to control number four, just actually diverging on this last bit that you see here on the GPS tracking. So we're live now with Olaf Lindenez, the last starter. And we can see that he's going to be slower than Fosser and Berman, probably slower than Matthias Kubert as well. Uh, as they go there. So those uh, three, apart from Londoners, are the, the fastest three at control number six, which is where we get uh, the time check. Uh, it's where we get the split times from there. Mm, I think we will have uh, 
five runners within uh, one minute at control six. Kasper Fosse, Gustav Bergman, Mattias Kibots, Daniel Hopman and uh, Olav Lundenes. So yeah, we are live there with uh, Olaf Lundenes GPS, a synchronized um, route. But uh, I think that graphic really shows you a lot with um, Foster just being 28 seconds faster I mean, than anybody else. He's, he's running the same, exactly the same route as uh, Kibbutz, and he's just 35 seconds faster. And Kibbutz, I mean, we talk about him so much as, as such a fast runner on the, on the tracks and on yeah, the roads, he but he didn't seem to be able to make an impact, maybe yeah. like he would normally. I mean, we, we've seen that he lost some time out from the control, but still, I mean, what, what a self-confidence this junior has to put in so much energy on pushing hard on the road, and it's still quite much in the beginning. I mean, it's uh, control six is after 25 minutes. You still have more than an hour to go from there. And uh, he's not even thinking about that he could lose, like he could be missing the energy in the end. It's just pushing very hard and going for it. That's good. So Olaf Lundin is here. Uh, he lost again. You can see about 30 seconds from control three to control number four. That's number five. And we'll get his time at number six. But you can see it's going to be slower than uh, Foster and Bellman at this point as the it is raining. Yeah, I was go I, w I could hear the sound of some rain, but couldn't yeah, see it the on the camera. Yeah, the sound you hear is uh, actually all of London. Well, yes, but you can also hear thinking, some rain. I think he, will, he never sees any animals in the forest when he's running like that. <laughs> they will hear him coming all the time. Yeah, now it's... Yeah, it is quite rain. It's not raining here at the arena, but there are some black clouds around. And of course, pushing all the way around this course. So goes fourth. Slurred and Kibbutz. Uh, it's in between the two suites, faster than Daniel Hoopman. And so with that's all the runners through control number six now. And we can see here Casper Fosser, he is the leader at the finish. One well, second faster. Let's, let's count in Wojtek Kral uh, as a runner within uh, one minute as well. So we have uh, sec six runners here. Um... And this is Albin Niederfeld. He is uh, coming into the finish now after that run. Looks like he was 10th at uh, that control number six. One minute 44 down. And looks he is now going to be four minutes slower than Kasper Fosser. But Albin Niederfeld into the finish, into this arena that we're using for every single final uh, this week. Of course, the first World Championships that are split, first Forest only World Championships. And crosses the line, second place for 23, but lots of space between Foster and the Niederfeld for other runners to uh, make their marks. There's also a lot of space between uh, Niederfeld and Graham Griswold. <laughs> That's true too. Seven minutes. Big gaps. Uh, he definitely didn't see the route around there. He was surprised when the coach showed him that that's actually an option, the fastest option. Uh, and uh, he got the information that Gustav went. Uh, Root uh, in the middle, and that he was doing it very well as well. So there, there were two options you could choose there. That was the information he got from Håkan Karlsson, the coach, the Swedish team. And here we are with Inve Svensk. So now we're uh, more than six minutes behind the leader. This is at split control uh, number three, where Kasper Fosse uh, leading, calls Alvin Riederfeldt second. You can see on the right-hand side of the picture where uh, Emil Svensk lost his time. It was on control number five, well, four and five. 
And uh, losing a, uh, some seconds at subsequent controls. Not but, too I mean, much, he, though. He knows as well that he lost a lot of time. He's very aware of that there's no chance for a medal today. And uh, actually, I would say it's very good performance to not lose more after that because it's it was quite early in the race and um, it's tough to keep on pushing on the long distance here, especially when you know that there are other races coming. You are one of the favorites for a medal. And um, yeah, it's just a pity. Yes, yeah, so let's have a look at some more of the replays here. It's going more straight than Foster, who is heading for this small path. Um, in the end. Ah, small mistake there. Kibbutz didn't really see the path, was my feeling. Yeah, it's only very indistinct path in that semi-open. Yeah. Really but Fossil, I think, this, also uh, that, that route choice as well, out of control number six, choosing uh, to go north of the line. mistake there again, uh, but only a few seconds. Let's say it's 80 seconds now. The gap between Fossil and Kibbutz. It was 20 seconds at control number six. Martin Hoopman here into control number 15. Martin Hoopman, we know that he definitely picked the wrong route to control number four. Lost almost three minutes there. But into third place though. Those are the standings at, uh, at that control number 15. That's the third time we see them around the course. Kasper Fosser leading by four and a half minutes. Emil Svensk at that point, 6.26 uh, down, but still in uh, fifth. It's very early days there. Let's have another look at this route from six to seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going more straight there. Then Kibbutz. The gap was one second between Fosser and Perman. Well, it might it's be two same. or three seconds now. <laughs> But it, it seems, uh, I mean, look at this. Kasper Foster is running really good in this part, uh, in this technical part, and he is running. Oh! It's a big mistake. I think that's a direction mistake out of control, like, like 45, 50 degrees in the wrong direction. And Don't maybe gets confused really with this crag. I mean, he had the wrong direction out from the control. He sees this hill uh, with a cliff and thinks that the hill uh, more to the north under the red line. And then continuing with this parallel mistake. <laughs> yeah, it looks good for Casper Fosser. Well, Casper Fosser will have a long wait sitting on the leader's chair. I'm sure he's quite there yet. As still a lot of small athletes yet to come. I wonder who the youngest world champion ever was. Yeah. Was it Jürgen Drostrup? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe we'll have a new one. I'm quite sure that we have never had a junior winning a uh, long distance, at least. And especially... I, I, do, I wouldn't guarantee... I, like, I don't know it, but that's my guess. But we are quite... Uh, we, there's a long way to go still. <laughs> there is a long way to go. There's a lot of opportunities to uh, lose and gain time around this course. And we haven't seen Kasper Foster's roots around the whole of the course. We're not nope. sure if there was any point where he... Uh, uh, lost any time, gained any time. Elias Kuka lost a lot of time here. He was 117 behind at control six, and now it's four minutes and three seconds. Now we add Lindenes to this mix as we see their routes from six to seven, going very similar to Kibbutz. He's doing it very smart there to choose to go up to this path, um, not taking any risks. But still, I mean, it's, it's fast, it's not just... Uh, Avoiding risk, he also, I'm sure he's convinced that it is fast as well. But still, it's smart to do so. The thing is, it could be, t it's, it's both avoiding risk, but it's taking a risk as well, because if you think traditionally fast, the straightest, yeah, it, it the fastest. It depends on how you define the risk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Berman's, uh, his mistake there, you can see again, control number nine, and we're live there with Lundanez. 
as Mika Kirmela is here into the finish. Mm -hmm. Going to a third position. Around the eight minutes behind. Oh. Trying to see where he's uh, was time on from the splits. Yeah, was seven and a half minutes behind at control 23 and seven minutes, seven and a half minutes at Arena passage as well, so lost one minute on the last loop. Don't know if we get a lot of information uh, from that. I mean, Mika Kirmla is a very good runner. Uh, he has proven that at the World Cup in Finland with the fourth position in the chasing start. <laughs> These are the standings at the finish with Mika Gimler coming into that third place. Still, look, you can see those huge gaps at, uh, with the leaders. The, uh, the fastest group is a group of 10 who are based on uh, world rankings and uh, previous WOC results. They are the last 10 to start. And then, um, so the idea is that the fastest guys will be at uh, the end. But Casper Fossa, you know, a junior, he won't have many world ranking points compared to the others. Of course, he doesn't have any previous uh, WOC results to uh, base go off of. But um, I mean, uh in a race like this, it's in this kind of terrain, you don't get a lot of path because you have many different micro route choices you can take. Um, it might even be good for a young runner that he doesn't have to wait very, very long. I mean, it's still a long time he has to wait in the in the quarantine, but uh, he can head out. Uh, just makes you nervous to sit there and do nothing and might be I mean it doesn't really matter in this kind of race of course he would have had the chance to catch runners if he had uh, I mean he catch he caught the many runners uh, I'm sure but it's not uh, it's not the same feedback you get as if you would uh, catch one of the other favorites so uh, that's the only disadvantage you see otherwise uh, just just go for it I mean it doesn't matter so Timo Sills and Melek Minar going there, third and seventh fastest at control number 23. Timo Sills catching Minar by uh, six minutes. It's a three minute start interval. We, we haven't got any loops on this course. The uh, second year in a row that we haven't got any uh, loops. There is though a um, three minute starting interval. And let's have a look at this replay from into control number 10. I have nothing to complain here. Uh, well, maybe I, I, I'm a bit surprised that Hoopman is choosing to run in the slope there. Um, and this route choice might, I mean, I don't, I can't imagine that anyone else is, I don't see anyone else going back there. This could be very decisive here. Um, it's not unexpected that we see Lunanes going straight. And, and decisive in Lundanes' favour? Hmm? And do you think it's decisive in, in the favour of Lundanes for hit for uh, That's the interesting thing to see because we haven't <laughs> seen any... I can imagine that... The, uh, I can imagine that it's a good option to go around, but it, it haven't been there. I don't know how tough the terrain is. I talked to Emma Johansson yesterday. Uh, she said it's very tough up there. You wouldn't like to be there. Um, at the same at the same time, we know that London has, is very good when it is really tough. So I, I don't really know, but I also know that there is like a small path 
Uh, down there in the valley where we have seen Foster, he was heading back out from the control, and then you have a a uh, small path there leading up to this out-of-bounds area. It's not on the map, but you, you often have that in Norway, close to the marshes. And, uh, I mean, that's a fast thing. I'm uh, Kibbutz is going the one uh, we have seen drawn on the map from, from the, like, on, in the graphic. But I think that it's better to go down directly, as Casper Foster was doing. So but it's always, it's so tough to go, it's... it's it's nothing you would like to do in a race because you know that you're not getting... You actually go... You have to do two steps closer to the control with every step you go away from the control. So, oh, that's the, it's a tough one. Yeah, well, we'll see how it plays out over the next uh, few minutes. Uh, as Martin Hubman comes through, he's currently in third place, running through this arena for a shorter loop now uh, before he makes his way to the finish, just taking on some liquids. This is a coaching zone here. Just run past our commentary positions as uh, the coaches there giving their athletes some encouragement, some advice, uh, some liquids on uh, this long day. Luckily, it isn't too warm uh, here today. Nothing like the high 20s we saw over in Finland and a lot of uh, supporters still sticking around here after the spectator races that we had in this uh, great... Yeah, um, and that's what I said. I mean, Kibbutz is going down there as well. Um, I, I think it would have been better to go there directly from the control. Um, but now the interesting part will be if Fosser is faster um, on the rest of the leg. We see that Lundness is still on the, on the red line. Uh, so every meter Fosser is away from the red line, he has to do more in the end. But of course he will go out to this uh, asphalt roads and there he we have seen that on the way to the fourth control uh, it's one of his uh, he is one of the strongest runners obviously today and uh, he can play that card there again yeah and you can just look at the the length of the tails it's a 60 second tail that they've got there on the tracking and i mean you can't really see Casper Fossers now, it's under the green line, but that gives an, indi an indication of the, the speed at which they're running, and you can see the speed that Fosser is able to go uh, around the course there, uh, in comparison to that of Lundanez. Live, of course, Lundanez, he was the last starter, but here's Timo Sild into the finish. The Estonian. Got uh, two tenth positions in the long distance 2016 2017 at the World Championships. Running, looks like, I'm not sure if he's running the middle as well, but he's going to go into a new third fastest time here. Timo still into the finish. Giving it all, leaving it all out in the forest. Taking it, of course, all the way to the line. And absolutely spent. As we said before, quite a lot of the runners doing every discipline this uh, week. There is, of course, a rest day tomorrow. Let's have a look at the tracking here. Yeah, so it's definitely a good choice, at least if you go, if you plan to go out on the uh, asphalt road. See that he is, well, let's say two minutes faster than Hoopman there. Mm, if not more, actually. I don't know if they were synced at the, at the start. Oh, it's a replay, so. Gennakos Osman into the finish as well. Now looks like he's had some troubles in the forest going sick fastest. Just uh, 16 seconds slower than Graham Gristwood. Mm. 
And yeah, look at this, uh, these tracking Fosset and Daniel Hubman into control 13. You can see the terrain has oh, changed oh, once again. Oh, we see a small mistake there. <laughs> the first I'm time I think we have seen a mistake from Casper Fosser. I'm, I'm a bit relieved. I, it, it felt so un, in, unhuman there, yeah. uh, at least for a junior. <laughs> and now we have seen that he did maybe seven seconds of a mistake, so what a relief. <laughs> 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 no, it was very, I mean, this is just amazing. It is amazing. And Daniel Hoopman to be two minutes behind that time. Uh, of Kasper Fosser, as we see, he's going to make his way towards control um, number 15. Again, losing like a minute between, uh, well, 45 so the seconds. But they weren't synced then because he lost uh, 40 seconds from control 10 to 13 on this long route there. So it's uh, it's not as bad as we thought it would be. Or then we missed a big mistake by Foster somewhere, Control 11, 12, but I don't think so. I think we would have seen it. Yes, I agree. I think we would have seen it too. Um, still waiting for Daniel Hubman here into Control number 15. I think I see him coming there. Yeah. And Daniel Hubman, as, as well as like Leonard Novikov, as you see, he's caught up Hector Haynes, those six minutes there. Um, it's one of the first of that really top group, you know, the, the red group, we might call it, if it was mountain bike of um, the best of the top ten runners. They are in a random order within that. But Casper Fossa just uh, making himself comfortable on that leader's chair. I think he's surprised himself, actually, uh, with uh, his performance. And you can see his reaction on the finish line. I think it you know, might take a while to sink in there. But, of course, we'll have a lot of home support here at these... Uh, World Championships, but it'd be it, it's interesting to it might be interesting to hear from him how much his focus was on the world the Junior World Championships this year. You know, training for the terrain in Denmark, and then had that. Uh, my, my guess is that it was almost nothing. Yeah, no, well, nothing on on Chevog. Okay, all That's his focus guess. all his focus was on. When he was going for the World Championships. Ships, if he would have a chance to go there, uh, he would go to the Junior World Championships anyway. He would be the big favorite there anyway. Uh, why should he put a lot of effort there when he has uh, the goal to go to World Championships? So we are now uh, replaying here, and the tail, our three minute tail, and you can see here this is the long route choice. Lundanez now making his way to go towards this road, but you can see, and, and everybody here, you can see all the tracks here making their way towards this road. But it seems like if you were going to go to the road, you should have gone there sooner rather than yep. later. Well played. Um, and it's not synced, so we keep that in mind. That's not the difference on this leg, it's a no, total difference. That's a difference from the beginning, as if they all started the course um, at the same time. More and more, we have to say it looks really good for Kasper Foster. I mean, the, the big question though is we don't really know how fast, if he had lack of energy on the last loop or how it looked there, but uh, well, it, when we saw him coming here, it didn't look like that. So Emma Svensk goes into that third spot at uh, control 23. But back to this GPS tracking on this long leg. And you can see the speed that Fossa is able to carry going along this track. It's a three minute tail. No, it's a two minute tail. Oh, it's a two minute tail. But of course, we have to bear in mind that seven second mistake that he made at control yeah, 13. Of course. <laughs> So, yes. And uh, it will be <laughs> Kibbutz and Lundenes, they will have uh, quite the same time there. This is going to be an interesting fight between Kibbutz and Lundenes. Yeah, we are already talking about the fight behind, the fight behind uh, Kasper Foster. This is just incredible. So let's and have now we, we see the replay of the biggest mistake so far. Kasper Foster is doing to control 13. 
This is Vujic Kral as well. So yeah, that small mistake into control 13. And Kral is here on his way uh, through controls 13, 14, 15. And you can see he's already two minutes slower than Kasper Fosser. So Vujic Kral number 71 in those top 10 ranked athletes. And you can see actually losing quite a lot of time between controls 10 and 13, going from 145 down to 327. So losing a minute and a quarter there. More than that, quick maths. Um, as he now will drop down this leaderboard. This is the control he's looking for. This is control number 15 in a small depression. And there's a white part of the forest. You can see a little re-entrant on the way to lead you into that control. Good visibility. It is quite mixed, the terrain. And um, with, with some of our camera locations often being the parts with the highest visibility, so we can see the athletes. So maybe not always a good representation of what it's always like out there uh, in the terrain, in uh, the forest. And then you can, see, you can actually see as they get there, uh, they'll run into a section of uh, green, more dense trees. You can see that the, uh, the visibility just immediately drops as uh, you go into that different part of vegetation. So we'll take Kral there into third place. And I think, you know what, I think it's some tense times for some of the Norwegians here. Let's have a look, though, uh, live with Lundanez. And he's just... Uh, behind Kibbutz. I wonder if we just like lost his tracker there as it's gone, as it's not red, and we'll catch up with him uh, as he goes further along this track. Although this is, it says this is a replay now. Mm -hmm. No, there we go. We just lost his tracker quickly through that terrain. But Kibbutz and Lindener is very close together. We can see actually the track, a uh, two minute long tail. So they're just less than two minutes I can't see the end of the green track, that's why it's... Oh yeah, you can see, yeah, they're just less than two minutes behind uh, Fosser. So 1.45, maybe. Casper Fosser would be able to, or we knew, but uh, it was obvious that he has the capacity to be in the top 10. He's such a super talent, uh, but I would never thought that uh, he would fight for the gold medal here. Emil Svensk here into the finish. He was one of the names that we were looking out for, but uh, as you might have seen if you've been watching our coverage all the way through, that four minute mistake to control number five basically put an end to his race. Winner of the test races, fantastic performance at Eukola as well, but it has not been Emil Svenske's day in the forest today. You know what, he's done really well to be able to pick his race up after that. Maybe, you know, he just thought he has nothing to lose now and actually oriented better. But I mean, here he's doing a great race from, uh, from all the way from control five to the finish. Mm. But uh, he lost five minutes on the control four and five. Mm -hmm. So uh, he would be in the fight for the medals here without those mistakes, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, that's correct there. So Svensk will finish down in third place, 5.55 down, that mistake. And I, like the, I like the spirit he's showing here. I mean, he's not giving up. He, he wants to do a good race. It will give him good self-confidence that he could like switch from this after, after the mistakes and back to do good orienteering. Um, now he has some controls where he was really fast. Uh, in the end of the course, or in the end, in the second par uh, part of the course. And, um, well, that's something to build on for uh, for the Middle Eastern's final. So here's a runner we haven't seen much of so far, Frédéric Tronchon, the Frenchman. You can see uh, on the bottom right, losing more time between controls 10 and 13. Just 
getting the punch, checking it's registered and keeping running there. So through control 15 in fifth place. Quite close with some of them there, but we do know there are athletes about two minutes down on Casper Fossa. Uh, Matthias Gibbert and Olaf Lundinez racing it out there. And of course, we haven't seen the whole of Casper Fossa's route, especially the, the part after the arena passage. Daniel Hubman, though, he is now making his way through the arena. He's got to punch this control and then uh, he'll be cheered on by everybody in and, the arena. Um, he actually caught 17 seconds here. Yes, he is just From so he's control 15 to the arena. So he is uh, one minute 35 seconds, I think, slower as uh, Martin Hubman is also uh, into the finish. But Daniel Hubman catching up some time. We'll see what he's able to do in this last part of the course. Uh, Martin Hubman, he is beginning to the finish. So we have both Hubman brothers through the arena at the same time. Martin Hubman. Uh, he will go into the new third fastest time, but as we can see, big, big gaps at this point. It's exciting to see Daniel Hubbard. He's got a very uh, high speed through the terrain, and um, there are, is a possibility to, of course, gain time on the final loop after the arena passage. As, and, uh, as I said earlier, we have no uh, idea about the speed uh, Kasper Foster had on the last loop. We haven't seen any GPS from him there. We don't know if he has done any mistake in the last part. I don't know. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, so those are the it ain't over till it's over. It isn't, no. So, split three, Daniel Hubman, 152 behind. And then at control 18, we know uh, on our screens, he was 135 behind. So, catching seconds here and there, you know, it all adds up. There's still uh, lots to be said for his run. We'll have to wait and see him, hopefully catch him at control 23 and then at the finish. I mean... Uh, <laughs> yeah, Martin Hoopman was uh, spending quite some time here, Fredrikstad, so uh, he understands, obviously, Norwegian, but he doesn't talk it yet. So, so now we see also that Lundenes came away from Matthias Kibbert, now the first man to chase Kasper Foster here. And I mean, this uh, is, let's say, one minute. And we have seen that Hoopman actually came 17 seconds closer, the last part of the arena. So uh, if he can continue to catch time here, I'm sure it, uh, especially, I mean, we're not, we shouldn't forget that Casper Foster still is a junior. There's, there might be a risk that he s lost a little bit of speed in the end, and uh, that won't happen to Olaf Lundenes. And uh, if uh, he is within a minute here at the Arena Passage, uh, there's still there's still a chance for Lundenes. So here we can see some of these routes, Kral going all the way around there, and this is where we see Hubman perhaps catching up a little bit of time, just in those uh, maybe the little micro route choices through the terrain. But Kral, very um, interesting to see him go all the way mm. around to control number 16, losing out there. Seems to be a bit tired. Yeah, and the untiredness is going to affect, of course, that route choice. And I mean, going back to Foster, yeah, he's not used to running you know, these 91 minute winning time in competition. No, I mean, he has a very special uh, training style as well. He's not uh, training those long, like he's, he's not the typical Norwegian guy when it comes to training. He's not uh, training these long sessions. He has many sessions, shorter sessions, high intensive sessions. And uh, he's still quite young. Um, so it, it, it will be so interesting to see how, how his speed is on this last part. Obviously it was good because his, his time is great in the finish, but uh, compared to Lundenes and the other guys coming. We'll have to wait and see as Elias Kuka comes into the finish. He's going to be racing that time with Emil Svensk and getting cheered on here. Oh, 
So it's going to be very tight with that time of Emil Svensk. Uh, no, Svensk will just go faster. As we also see, just back a picture with the Kral going through. I think that must be the arena passage for him. So Finn crosses the line into fifth place currently. Magna Dali here then to uh, control number 15. See this uh, white forest. You can see him in the distance there, just behind the tree. It's going to pop into our view. And again, losing more time throughout this course. Going to be about four minutes down. But, you know, he's caught some time from controls 13 to 15. Now 4.03. So there are runners out there catching time on Casper Fosser. Casper Fosser, I believe, is just going to have a interview with Norwegian TV, but we'll be feeling very nervous here. Let's have another look then. Replay here. Controls 11 to 12. Mm, different, slightly different route. Make your foot staying on the path a bit longer. Uh, but now, it seems that Lundeles is getting closer and closer. It's definitely less than a minute now. Yeah, you can see, I think he's just going to have that faster speed at the end. And uh, when we, we know that Hukman was about 17 seconds faster from the TV control to the arena. So that's, let's say, that's approximately the, uh, the gap there. So definitely, there is a chance for London still to uh, take his fourth consecutive win in, uh, in the long distance. Yes, uh, again, we see that Kibbutz uh, chooses another route, going down to the path following the path and then uh, take uh, well I mean you can relax a bit you don't have to do the the job uh, technically there just run more or less it's it's hard to say hard to know how good this path is there is some parts where it seems uh, green in between and maybe not not as good runability as uh, it might seem on the first first view but Mm. I doubt uh, that he will catch time there. And then this is the one Fossa makes a small mistake too, but uh, his uh, Frédéric Tranchant is in fourth place there. It's control number 18, a couple of controls before they make the arena passage. But yeah, you can see from 15 to 16, he's caught up time on Fossil. So Frederick Tranchant cheered through this arena passage. Oh, need to make sure he doesn't miss this control. So a control that they punch twice. And here we can see in the terrain, this is Matthias Kibbertz to control number mm. 15. Together with uh, Gernot Kerschbaumer in Sien. And it's only, let's say, it's a minute maybe. No, a bit more. Yeah, he's still going to make it to control 15. Yeah, he lost uh, four. 43 seconds between control 10 and 13. Uh, it was 153 at control 13. Let's see. There they come. So 144 is the gap. Head of Daniel Hoopman. Mm -hmm. Would have been interesting to have this uh, route synced. Yes. 
The feeling is that he lost time compared to Hoopman. That's hard to tell as we are live with Kibbutz. Rudolf Stenis from Latvia going for uh, eighth posi position here. Stenis coming home for uh, Latvia. He is also up the top 10 so far. Stenis number 66. He has 140 now. Stenis. I think it's probably going to be good for him to maybe take his best ever result to walk long distance, his best so far, 26th in 2017. Leonid Novikov. From Russia. Silver in the long distance 2017. Mm. Not really his day today. a lot of time there on the long route between control 10 and 11 or on one of the following controls so we're back uh, comparing Kasper Foster and Olav Lundenes Ooh, well, I think Lundenes loses time by going through some of the green parts there yeah but uh, <laughs> it will be a tough battle between uh, the two Norwegian in the end. I'm quite sure about that. Uh, my guess would be that they, when the nurse is coming to the arena, that they have approximately the same time. Yes, but I, I have a feeling Lundenes will go faster on the last loop. We will wait and see. Mm -hmm. What a race this uh, long distance is turning out to be. And this will be him through to uh, the 15th control. This is number 14. He's got 44 seconds to make a new leading time. Let's see. I wonder who the Norwegian crowd, the Norwegian crowd will have a favorite with between the two Norwegians, of course. And uh, look, you can see there from the splits, always within 45 seconds of Fosset, but you can see catching up time there was 18 seconds behind. Mm -hmm. And oh, is he going to set a new leading time here at this control? With only uh, 15 seconds now, is he, I think he's going to set a new leading time here. Olaf Lundenes looking very strong here. And for once, there is a new leader now. At control number 15, Lindenez goes fastest. Mm, let me see here, <laughs> Gustav Fellman, he lost a lot of time. It's a long route between control 10 and 11. But let's focus on the fight for the gold medal. Yeah, Betterman's now lost too much time there in that point. He is out of a chance. We actually have two fights. I think it will have a fight for the gold and we have uh, will have a fight for the bronze medal. And the uh, fight for the gold between the two Norwegian runners, Olaf Lundenes and Kasper Fosse. And the fight for the bronze medal between the two Swiss runners, Matthias Kibbutz and Daniel Hopman. And uh, maybe, maybe Ruslan Glibov, but he is 47 seconds behind. Gustav Berman just under the four minutes behind there, but you can still see they are catching time compared to Kasper Fosse. Uh, here we have Daniel Hoopman on the way to the last control. 
Uh, we also have Magda Dali through the arena passage as well. So Daniel Hubman, he's been fighting uh, all the way. He's going to be slower than Kasper Fossil. Uh, not by much though, but uh, he's going to have to wait to see who after him will go quicker. So Daniel Hubman, it won't be another gold medal for him today, but it may well be another medal for the Swiss runner who's got medals in over half of the world's championship races that he has done in a fantastic career. Quite sure we'll have a runner with 100% medals in every race uh, after, this, uh, <laughs> after this race here. I'm actually watching out the window here and I see uh, an observing Kasper Foster he came back from the TV interview. He looks a little bit disappointed now. Yeah, I think he's still got a bit, he's got a smile, but it's more of a nervous smile, yeah. I think. Yeah, and of course, it's like, it, it seems that he's a bit disappointed that he lost uh, time there and this, uh, without uh, doing bigger mistakes. But I mean, he is uh, competing in Love London as maybe the best runner of long distance ever. Yes, but uh, you know when you've won Junior World Championships titles, the, the feeling of winning is uh, you get used to that. I think even uh, as a youngster, he's got used to that. And um, yes, it'll be very interesting. So we can see here. Oh, that was unexpected. That was unexpected. Oh. So let's see. That's interesting. Uh, Lindenes is I the last person you'd think exactly. to do that. I was not so much surprised that we saw by Kral choosing to go around, but it's a big surprise for me that we see you have done this. this. And Lindenez, as you can see, he's moving faster. Foster just going up the crag there. Yeah, of course he's faster than this part. Although if he wouldn't be faster here, then there's no, no reason <laughs> to go around. Yeah. I mean, he has to be, fa yeah. be running faster on the path. Yeah, of course. And it's the uphill for Foster. He, Foster's yeah. advantage will be on the second part of the, of the leg here. Yeah, when uh, Lindenez has to go that bit further to get into the control. That is surprising. And I wonder if if we will see Lindenez sticking in the open and going all the way around and approaching the control from the east, or whether he will try and uh, cut uh, more closely back to the line. Those are the standings, though. Control 15 with uh, everybody through that point. Lindenez leading by those eight seconds. And I think, you know, we saw Lindenez there ahead of... Um, Gustav Benjamin, but and, uh, here we have uh, Matthias Kibbutz. He actually caught half a minute from uh, control 15 to the arena passage. So, uh, there's an indication that uh, Kasper Fosser lost some time somewhere. Here we also see an advantage that uh, Kibbutz has which Kasper Foster didn't have. He has uh, other runners around. We saw uh, Gernot Kershbaum before, and uh, we see Hector Haynes here, even though uh, Hector Haynes is, uh, I think, going to the finish. Yeah, he'll go into just outside the top 10, I think. 11. Let's see, Let's back to the fight for the gold medal. This is the replay there. Obviously, London is that much quicker. And he does start to cut through the forest here. Oh, I think that will pay off from him yeah, for him, it will you know? Pay off, definitely. I mean, from here, it's approximately the same control taking. And London's distance is much shorter. Yeah. Well played. A, a risk that's paid off. I mean, he was he was looking faster anyway in uh, ahead at control 15, but going to gain some time there. The gap, the length of the tail is 60 seconds. So very soon we'll see um, Lundanez through the arena passage and we'll get a timing check at control 18. Tonchon here into control number 23 in fifth. By the time we see some of the others into the finish, he'll be out of a podium spot, I think, there. Rusan Glibov, then. But mm. he is going to be 30 seconds down on, on Daniel Hubman. Yeah. Good for a podium, though. Control 23. So, um, 
I think that's too much to catch in this last part. It's mostly running now. Um, so we will have the fight for the bronze medal between uh, Kibbutz and uh, Hoopman. So you can see here, 30 seconds gained by Lundinez on to control number 16, now 42 seconds faster uh, than Kasper Fosser, his teammate. And such great pace throughout the whole course, very experienced. Five uh, gold medals uh, oh, it's in the World Championships. Almost a minute for the Netherlands. Changed it. quickly. It did. Wojtek Kral here now towards the finish. Czech athlete. But you can see his time ticking by there. He, by the time some of those faster ones who are about uh, that minute, minute and a half behind Fossa come in, he's going to be pushed down the standings. Wojtek Kral. Of course, I'm sure the next Forest World Championships, two years time in the Czech Republic, will already be on his mind. But performing here, he's going to make it all the way to the finish. Is he going to sneak in ahead of Alvin Riedefeld? I think he will in the end as he just goes past the corner. Yeah. He will do that. And just crossing there into new third fastest time. Here we have him, Ulav Lundanaus, coming to the arena passage. And now leading the race with almost a minute ahead of uh, Kasper Fosser. Yeah, so 54 seconds at control 18. This is control 19 that he's just punched. And of course, very familiar form of Olaf Lundanez. He's just got uh, the shortish loop to go. And now he will pass just in front of Kasper Foster there, some meters away. Kasper Foster oh, stands standing. and applauds his teammate as he passes through the arena being cheered on and uh, Kasper Fossa not smiling anymore. <laughs> but I mean, if we end up with Norwegian gold and silver. I mean, uh, for sure he's very, very satisfied with his race, but uh, he was in the game for the gold medal, or he still is. Um, but losing time without doing bigger mistakes, and that's, uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, he's not used uh, to this situ situation from the junior races. And uh, of course, he has been competing many times against the world's best runners. But it's, it's, it's tough to, to see that you lose more than a minute uh, on just a few kilometers without doing bigger mistakes. And now will he be thinking about uh, whether he's going to be able to defend that silver medal place with uh, the two uh, two well, I think guys the gap. Fast. I think the gap is too big. I mean, he has uh, Daniel Hoopman is in the finish, so there's no threat from him. So it's Matthias Kibbutz out there, and I think the gap is too big. I don't think he has to be afraid of that. Gustav Bellman is now uh, into this arena passage, so you can. Olav Lindenez has overtaken him. It was probably on that longer, that's a long leg from 10 to 11. So I wonder if Gustav Berman will know that he's been overtaken by Olaf Lindenez. I'm sure he'll get some feedback as he comes through this arena passage here. Uh, I'm sure he's uh, been one that a lot of the orienteering fans have been looking forward to uh, carry a lot of the Swedish hopes here at these world championships, but not managed to deliver today as we have Ruslan Glibov and Frederick Tonchon in here to the finish. And Glibov is going to go slower than Daniel Hubman. You can see he's got 10 seconds to be faster than the Swiss runner, and he's not going to make that. So Glibov probably out of that medal chance, and Kasper Fossa will be thinking another medal contender has gone slower than he has. So Glibov there will settle for that third place in the standings. 
strong run from last year's silver medalist. It won't be a medal this time as he crosses that line into third place. You can see losing some time in the middle of the course, gaining some time, a lot of time mm -hmm. towards the end. And and I mean, that's uh, the part where uh, we have seen Lundgren coming closer and closer. Uh, at least there between control uh, 16 and uh, the, the arena passage, but he also continued to catch time in the end. So with Glibov uh, finishing. Okay, I knew when there. No, no, there. No, I should have watched behind you. Okay, here, so we came around. Yeah. And then you're on this way and then this way. Okay, yeah, yeah. It was more the same. Yeah. Oh. Tom saying he was surprised to see Glibov. He started three minutes uh, ahead of the Ukrainian. Here we have the comparison between Lundanes and Kasper Foster. It's almost exactly one minute now. Let's see about the speed. It's hard to tell. But Lundanes is not making any mistakes there. Well, it's the very beginning of the playing. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. But, but, you know, clean run from Lundanes on this part. Uh, there is, uh, I don't know if I should call it a possibility, but there is, uh, you can do some smaller miss at control 20 and 21. I would be very surprised if it would happen at control 22, 23. It just seems too open and uh, We've seen Lundanes executing the legs and the orienteering before. I don't expect him to do a mistake there. But of course, never say never. No, but, but he is, as he has demonstrated, he is someone who can keep his focus all the way through that long distance. And that is really what counts, really what matters. And he's been in this position many, many times. Someone's nervous there. We have uh, Kibbutz and Hoopman. And now we have Hoopman. This is Race of Bronze. Advantage there. Oh. No. No. Kibbutz, he didn't have the best uh, preparation for this World Championships with his injury. Might this affect the last part of the course here? Seems uh, there's a uh, for sure advantage for Daniel Hoopman. So yeah, live with Kibbutz. Mm -hmm. This we is will get a split time at uh, control 23. Yeah, this is surely the uh, the fight for the bronze and at the finish. Daniel Hoopman was one minute and 19 seconds slower than Kasper Fosser. Here we are at control 23. And we are waiting for Matthias Kiburts. See, it's a uh, different vegetation here. I think I hear someone coming there. There he is. 15 seconds to go to the control. Uh, yeah, running with this, this four, it's quite I think group it counts. Behind him. Ooh, it's That's gonna it. be quite close. But you can see he's looking around quite a lot for the for the control, running with the... So there the time, it's running out. How far away is the control? So here, still very close. Nine seconds behind Hoopman. And everyone who has seen Kibbutz like running on the last meters knows that uh, is he in contention within, like, let's say, 10 seconds at the last two controls, everything can happen. Of course, I mean, Putman is not a, it's not a bad runner either. So, but the th it's just the thing that you know that you are fighting for the medal because I'm sure he will get the information at some point. Uh, I don't actually know if the coaches will uh, will say something when it's between two Swiss runners, mm. but um, he will. For but sure he will hear, hear the, on the, the speaker. speaker. Yeah. But you see uh, uh, over a minute gap, uh, Lindenez to Fossa now as uh, another of the Norwegians, Magna Dali, now into the finish. Again, he's uh, those three minutes down. And he made a, again, mistake to, uh, well, route choice mistake to control number four. We know that. Went uh, south of the red line. And uh, we'll try and end up on the podium here. It's going to go into the new fourth fastest time. Has to keep, of course, that 
great consistent running all the way throughout the course. And cheer now on this run in. It's going to be a solid new uh, four fastest time here. Going to go just ahead of Wojtek Kral from the Czech Republic. So fourth place there with a lot of the damage being done as you can see between controls three and four and again from controls uh, 10 to 13 those long legs that have been proved decisive uh, I think we're waiting for Londoners <laughs> I, I hear him coming yeah we can indeed hear him he's on his way to uh, split number four which is at control number 23 and look you can see that time counting down to the time of Fossers I think it, this will not be control number 23 I'm not sure yeah, it uh, is. maybe it is he's caught up a lot of time see at control 20 he was 21 seconds 1 minute and 21 seconds ahead of Fosser and at Londoners just keeping that fantastic pace around the whole course and particularly at the end there. Oh! It's missing the control there. As he turned Ooh. round. Oh, goodness and me. And I'm what? taking a look at Kasper Fosser out there. Ooh. He keeps going. <laughs> uh, he's turned now around he now. It's just a small mistake. So there you could see that he had a feeling for the distance. He knew when the control should be coming. Just took just, let's say, 20 meters too much in distance and then uh, all the, the bells were ringing in his head that, you know, some, now the control should be here. So we're sto stopping, turning around and they got the control. So we just lost about, let's say, 10, 15, 20 seconds. Yeah, let's see if we can see that on the tracking. So again, the gap on the tails there, 60 seconds. So he's even good at doing mistakes. <laughs> Oh, Fosser a bit hesitant, I think, into control 22, actually looking... Uh, okay. uh, London, as he, I think he could see this small path there when he ah. came, uh, too far, so it's not that hard to get a feeling for the distance. <laughs> but yeah, just that slightly left of the line and onto the track now, so... And uh, let's say it, he's the old and new world champion in long distance. He is indeed. I mean, it's not over till it's over, but the last yeah, but few controls are basically a run-in. Well, we let's let's uh, make a bet, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not willing to bet against him now. No way. But Matthias Kibberts now is on the race for a medal here. It's going to be between him and between his Swiss teammates, Daniel Hubman, and we can see the gap there. So as the time ticks by, Kibberts has to be faster than Hubman if he's going to get a medal here today. It will be his first medal in the long distance if he is uh, to be quicker than his teammate as Lundanez is still to make the finish. But we know Lundanez is much, much quicker. So Kibbert versus Hubman here for Switzerland for the medals. But look, the time is ticking by. I think Kibbert is going to be too late here. He's going to sprint for all it's worth. He's going to try and get as close as possible he knows from the arena speaker, he knows from the team that it's going to be very, very, very close with his teammate. He's only got a few seconds here to make it towards the line. It's going to be so close with Hubbard, but Kibbert is just run out of a medal. It's going to be three seconds. And Kubert into third place there. He will probably end up fourth overall. It is going to be his best position at a long distance, his best previously being fifth, but it's not that medal that he wanted. Daniel Hubman will take the bronze medal. That's with so brutal. If you are on the last meters, you know it's tight and you... In the summer, you, the you cross the finish line and see that you're missing three seconds after 93 minutes. What a great effort from uh, Matthias Kibbert on the final stretch. I'm sure he caught up time on his teammate at the end there. Here's uh, Bellyman, and he's losing uh, even more time now. Six minutes behind. He will be uh, disappointed uh, with his race, been performing very well. He's struggled a lot at the World uh, Championship races uh, previously, um, but I think 
has had some form in recent years and this will not be his day. Look at how close it was oh. between those two Swiss runners and actually choosing different routes. See, look at them, so close around this Very whole stretch. Very contention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems that Hoopman had a little bit more energy in the uphill there. Uh, the feeling is that he lost the time up to control 24. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, he, I don't think he was aware of that it would be so tight. Otherwise, he might have pushed harder from the beginning. But it's hard to s I mean, that's, it's always very easy to say uh, afterwards. So now we're waiting for Lundinez. Here he is. Here's the Norwegian. And look at that time. It's looking fantastic. He was the final starter in the forest today. Lundinez is going to run into his sixth world uh, long distance title. His fourth long distance gold medal in a row. It's not been the best race for him the whole way around, but what he's managed to do is he's managed to keep it going all the way around. He's not lost the pace that Foster did. I would not say it wasn't the best race. I mean, he was very good all the way. It was just that Casper Foster was even better in the beginning and lost a little bit of energy in the end. But I mean, what, what could we say more about London? As we have said it one year ago, two years ago, he's just the king of the long distance. He wins in every kind of terrain. It's maybe the least surprise that he wins in home soil, but the way he's doing it, just executing every leg, almost perfectly not doing any mistakes year after year after year that's just it's just the best uh, long distance orient year ever i think in my opinion well london airs crosses the line gets that fourth gold medal in a row 90 minutes and nine seconds taking that win by 139 fosser gets second place and uh I think he's keen to download quite quickly, but oh, four medals in a row in this long distance for Olaf Lundinez. How does he do it? There we see also the rest of the family waiting for him. There. <laughs> I see that the child is very exciting as well. <laughs> uh, very excited. <laughs> so Norway 1-2 in this race with uh, Daniel Hubman, Switzerland in third and Olaf Lindenez absolutely spent he knows how to give it his all around that long distance <laughs> yeah, he's asking if uh, everything was uh, right with the crunchy system. I don't think there will be any problems with that. And the orienteering media can uh, celebrate that fourth gold there for Lindenev. So, what I mean, what did you make of that race? Um, it was kind of expected that uh, the two root choices will be very decisive today. Um, I, I actually I'm very surprised that the big difference happened on the second on the second leg. Uh, the second long route. Um, I would never have thought that it's so much faster to take the route Casper uh, Foster did. Um, but it also showed that uh, you have to do a race all the way very good on a very high level to to beat Olaf Lundenes. And Casper uh, Foster, I mean, he did an almost perfect race, but in the end it was just 
Maybe it has to be in... Uh, he, he needs one or two more years to really build up this uh, stamina to be there all the way and uh, be able to push even on the last two or three kilometers. But he did a great race. I mean, that's it's just crazy. He's still a junior and he's going for silver. He's winning the silver medal in the long distance. And uh, I mean, there are other people struggling to beat Olaf Lundenas as well in this distance. So uh, that wasn't a surprise. And then uh, we have the two Swiss. Uh, we did very well, Daniel Hoopman and Matthias Kibbutz, especially Kibbutz who had problems with the injuries earlier. He did a very good race. Um, maybe missing a bit of the self-confidence and maybe also the speed on the long route. Um, we'll see if it's the same for the middle distance, but if, if at least it's, a, it's that in, on, on the longer distance. Um, but here we have the results. Olaf London S from Norway, world champion. Second place, Kasper Fosse, also from Norway. Daniel Hoopman, Matthias Kibbutz from Switzerland on position three and four. Then we have the medalist from last year, Ruslan Glebov from the Ukraine, in fifth position, and Magne Daly, Norway, in sixth position. Here we have comparison between Kasper Fosse, Daniel Uppmann, Matthias Kibbutz and Olaf Lunden. As we see that Kibbutz choosing to go around in the very beginning. I'm sure this, that was planned from the beginning that he would take every op opportunity to go around and it paid off for sure here we also know that uh, the fastest one to the first tv split was emil svens who did uh, quite a big mistake at control four and five and uh, all four runners here in the top four went around to the in the western part here only london is choosing this middle option here a bit straighter less distance but uh, more running in the terrain very high speed here by Casper Foster and staying on the path there attacking quite late but it was a good choice there so we had them together already early in the competition. And here we see that Kasper Foster is running more around on this small path. I think that uh, my opinion is that it is a very smart option to do so. So see that Hoopman maybe not the best uh, route choice there. Struggling a bit in the terrain. Here we have the part where we have seen uh, Gustav Berryman doing a mistake. Also, we see that Matthias Kibbutz did a small mistake here to control 10. My opinion that Hoopman is maybe going a bit much to the right there, but he didn't lose much time. Uh, this one very interesting. Kasper Foster backing out from the control, going all the way around. Kibbutz also going around, but uh, not as distinct as Kasper Foster. And, um, that's actually the point where I thought that Fosse might have decided to race. Coming to this street very early and uh, building up good speed. See so also that the uh, keyboard's option was okay, even though he didn't exit the control that well as Kasper Fosser. Here we see also that Hoopman is uh, almost a minute behind Lundness and Kibbutz. And uh, from this point, my feeling that Kasper Fosser ran out a little bit of energy. I mean, not a lot, uh, still, he has a very good speed, but compared to the other runners, the more experienced runners, um, he started to lose seconds at every control. And here we see still Hoopman one minute behind Kibbutz, and then Kibbutz. I don't think that was a good route to choose here. We can see the comparison between the two Swiss runners. It's almost a minute when they left the control. And uh, Lundnes there. 
With a bit uh, shaky root, not as straight as Fosser, but Fosser with a small mistake, maybe the only one at control 13. And we see that Kibbutz, he lost almost a minute to control 13. And then here, a very good choice by Lundness running around. Surpri I was surprised that he was doing that. Didn't expect him. I expected Kibbutz to do it, but not Lundness. And we see that Hopman and Fosser are going straight. And uh, from that part of the race, Lundness is just running quite much faster than compared to Kasper Fosser. And we see this is now we have uh, Hoopman there in front of Kibbutz. And I think it will be more or less this um, this situation until the last control or second last control. Small mistake here to control 23. We saw that in the picture by Olav Lundanes. But no bigger problems. Also Kasper Foster came uh, some meters too much to the west there. And in the end, an unthreatened uh, victory by Olaf Lundenes, who will hear in the interview now. So, Olaf, congratulations on four gold medals in the long distance now in a row. Is it a course that you were expecting? No, I think I think we all were surprised how much uh, around the golf course and on the road and uh, everything it was. Uh, but yeah, it seems like when it was some real forest uh, before the spectator control, I managed to got a gap, and yeah, I'm very happy with my race. Uh, maybe the body was a bit slow in the beginning, or Casper was just fast. I don't know. But you managed to keep that pace the whole way round, and you know, what do you think makes you have that edge that has allowed you to get four gold medals in a row? Of course, it's a lot of both training and preparation. I think we. We are preparing really hard for the long distance in Norway and uh, we have a really high level on all trainings and uh, for me it uh, when I was younger it was what I the long distance was what I really wanted to win uh, of course now I try to win both long and middle but there is something uh, the, what you learn when you were a child and youth you will take with you the whole career and if you felt there was some extra pressure on you with it being on home soil this year yeah, of course it was a little bit pressure, but uh, I feel that I was I won in Trondheim nine years ago, so it was I have done it before, so uh, it was just trying to repeat, repeat, uh, and I know I'm better than nine years ago, so I know I had every everything in my hands if I do the performance that was needed. Well, congratulations, well done today. <laughs> so we have some pictures here. And the bronze medalist Daniel Hoopman. And he proved again in every second, uh, more than every second uh, race at World Championships, he is winning medals. Second place, the incredible junior Kasper Fosser from Norway. Amazing race, especially on the first part, on the first two thirds of the race. He was leading all the way. And they did a great job. And here, the king of the long distance, the winner and world champion for the fourth time in a row, also from Norway, Olaf Lundanes. Here again, the top 10. The world champion from Norway, Olaf London, as we heard him in the interview. Uh, interesting that he said, uh, when, we c when we get back in the real forest, I think uh, I was the fastest one. <laughs> he didn't really like the, the long legs, I think. That's what, that is my opinion. No, I think it really wasn't what he was expecting. And, uh, but he also said he uh, maybe took some time to actually warm up and get his, get his speed going in the forest. Um, I think he was surprised how fast Casper Foster <laughs> went. There's some irritation there that mm, he was uh, yeah. slower than the junior. In yeah. The first 
Well, I mean, that just shows how impressive Casper Fosser is and like what potential he has in the future, um, to be honest as well. As everyone's so we're getting ready very shortly for, for the flower ceremony, for everything, and before we will move on to uh, the women's race as well. See uh, to Britain there, 20th and 21st. And we are now gonna go towards uh, this flower ceremony with the flowers, of course, awarded to the top three. Before we do then, uh, the, the results will be made official later on today, once any uh, complaints, protests have uh, been had, but uh, they can award <laughs> flowers in front of this crowd here. So everyone can get uh, their pictures, their medals will be awarded later on. So, the men's long distance. So third place for Daniel Hubman. His time one hour 33 minutes and seven seconds. He was nearly three minutes slower than Olaf Lundenaers in the end, but can uh, take a lot of satisfaction with a medal in his uh, 50th Kasper World Championships Fosser. race. And the junior then, Casper Fosser. Well, he was sat on that leader's chair until the very, very end. 91 minutes, 48 Perfect. seconds of running, winner. but the uh, winner champion. today, the world champion Once for the again. fourth time Go in away. a row, so now sixth time yeah. long distance yeah. world champion, Olaf Lundenez celebrates there at the flower ceremony. In the end, he won by over a minute and a half with some great running all the way around. So the top three then, you can see in picture, two Norwegians on that podium, and then Daniel Hubman from Switzerland in third place. And this crowd here in this fantastic arena that we have pretty much in the middle of the forest, right next to the golf course, can applaud the top three in this long distance. So of course we will get the um, medals will be presented and the podium which is top six will be presented um, later on. So of course the results confirmed. Uh, we have a rest day tomorrow. And then, of course, we will get to uh, move our focus onto the women's course. So I think that there's uh, the winners get their media, yeah, their photos taken. All the signs cheering on Casper Fosser there. And I think it's, I heard someone say it's the walk that's had uh, the most media attendance so far. And reasons for the uh, Norwegians to be happy. We'll be short there from uh, Ireland. Enjoying himself, but yeah, pictures from uh, all the runners as they've headed through. Gene Beveridge was one of uh, was leading when he finished very early on in uh, these World Championships long distance, considered by many as the toughest discipline in orienteering. And a lot of uh, people at the end of their runs really confirms that too. But there, Olaf and Dinez, the eventual winner of today's race.
Well, what a fantastic uh, men's race we had there. They're coming down to the last uh, starter taking that world title. And we will move on to the women's competition, which has been going for uh, a few hours already, I do believe. Again, a start interval of uh, three minutes on there. And uh, we have about 11 finishes in the women's class so far. Still good conditions out there. Good running, just warmed up a little bit. But it's pretty, considering the amount of rain they've had in Norway over the last week, it's uh, pretty dry out in the forest. It was a little shower we had earlier, but we hope a lot of our spectators are going to stick around for the women's, where the Swedes could find something to cheer. The favourite, of course, Tova Alexanderson. She too trying to defend three world titles in a row at this long distance. But Jonas, let's talk through this women's course map. Yep. Um, actually, it's quite a similar course as we have seen in the men's race. Uh, also a shorter loop here in this first part and a long leg. Not exactly the same route here. Um, we'll see that we have less options on this route to control five. Uh, again, we will have a TV control at control number four. And here we'll have the second TV split at control seven. From there, we will have a long leg up to control eight. Some shorter controls there, control 10. Uh, and then we already go back towards the arena passage, control 11. 12, 13, as we have seen it in the men's race, and then the last loop. Here again, until control 18, TV control, and back to the arena and the finish. So quite the same course, uh, shorter, of course, here, um, but two longer route choices which will be decisive, I, I think. Yep, so uh, course length there is uh, 11.7 kilometers. Again, well, initial estimated winning time was 80 minutes. On the screen there, it's been rounded down to 77. I think in reality, we'll go faster than that. Uh, around the course a lot quicker than I think people were initially expecting with uh, the men's winning time being that just over 90 minutes. So it's going to be another quick one and as of course we will see some of the faster runners starting later although our favorite for today's race Tova Alexanderson is about eighth from last. And let's have a look at what some of the terrain is like here. It's quite mixed. This is the route out for control number two, where there's quite a lot of uh, shorter new planted trees. But then going across here, you can see crossing the stream, the terrain changes quite significantly. We've seen it, it was very dense there at control two. Uh, changes back and very open. We have seen the man here in this part as well. Um, to control three. That's something the runners expect here, this kind of terrain. It's not the most difficult part here because there are so many features to read. Um, as I said before, I think the decisive moments will be the route choices and maybe controls towards the end when it's more flat and less uh, objects to read and details. Um, when you are tired, that's more difficult, I think. Um, here again, they show us four options. I don't think anyone will run the option we have seen in the men's race. It seems just too far away. Uh, I would think that the green one here actually is quite a good option, but let's see. Uh, when we see the first ones, first comparisons. 
But my guess is, I mean, you can run quite a distance on the road, and then you get the entrance there, um, which isn't too hard, and the control is closer to... Uh, it's more to the east, so it's not that fra far from the asphalt road as we have seen it uh, in the men's race. So actually the green one could be an, an option to choose. As I said, I don't think that, I mean, 4Ks compared to 3Ks is, it's, it seems too much to me. Mm -hmm. And then this, this next route choice as well. Let's have a look well, which the next they suggest. route choice. Again, I think the red, I don't think they will do the red one exactly as it's shown. Yeah, maybe, but then they will, then I would actually go more um, and pass 17, 16, 15 and try to keep up there in the little bit more open area and attack the control from there. Um, this is a tough one. I don't know really what they will choose and what's going to be the fastest. Uh, for me, it feels a little bit the same as the long leg in the men's race. It's interesting. I, it's hard for me to guess. Um, and there's lots but, of but there's choices they can take other than of those course, two marks. There's, there's exactly the same with the there are more options. Um, and there can be big differences in these options. And still, it's hard to see. And you have to collect some knowledge during the first controls about how good the runability is in the open areas, in the flat areas. Is it better to run on the hills? Is it better to run down in the valleys? Uh, how it is? How is it when it's wet? Should I? And you collect that information on the first part, and then try to use that to do a good, uh, to pick a good route on this long leg. And since I haven't been running, it's it's hard for me to to say and I also think it will be hard for the runners. They will choose something but not really knowing it was if it was the best. They will get to know it in the finish. Or maybe get a feedback when they catch a runner. Yeah and, and but even then you know you're using the terrain to make your decisions so you can just see from that like the terrain changes of course, uh, so yeah. much so quickly just in that short section. Um, again so you can see that the start list they've been uh, uh, going for a good few hours so far. Who are we looking though? Look out, looking out for in the women's? Well, when we were talking about the big favorite in the men's uh, race with Olaf Lundenes, then we have an, at least a big favorite here in the women's race, uh, Tove Alexanderson, of course, always a favorite. Um, but we also have Natalia Gempele, very strong runner, uh, Camilla Olausen, uh, Marika Taini, they are good in almost every race. And then also Lina Strand, uh, she showed great form. She's talking about having the best form uh, shape of her life uh, so far. So it's, uh, and she did very well in the test races here in Norway. So that's a name to keep on the list. Uh, but I would go, if I, I've, if I would have to pick five runners, I would pick uh, Alexanderson, Gempele, Olausen, Strand and Taini. Well, we will see. But of course, I mean, we have uh, Karlin Olsson, we have uh, the Swiss runners, we have, there are so many names, it's hard, but if I would have to, I mean, look yeah, at almost that everyone there. On, the, on, on this uh, list here uh, can go for a medal. But if, I, if I'm forced to pick five, I would pick those five. So those are the, the last ten to hit the forest, uh, which will be uh, quite soon. And the high you hit, the uh, Finn, just on this her way. So one minute before she starts, she goes onto this podium. Of course, the runners don't know that the start was here in the arena. Um, they were they're given information about where the quarantine is. And, uh, you know, uh, well, Jonas, you yourself were planning some courses, didn't expect uh, the start to be here. I thought they were a bit sneaky, the, the course planners. Uh, I didn't expect it at all, since I'm in the forbidden area, the out of bounds area before the competition, uh, before the World Championships, it's a very big area. And I actually thought that they would try to use, there are some different parts of the maps with, some, with different terrains. And my guess would have been in the long distance, you would have the start quite far away from the arena to try to be in many different kind of terrains but they have chosen to have to start in the arena, which I don't think many, many runners expected it uh, 
to be like that. Uh, we have heard Olav Lundenes who said that he was very surprised by the course planning. Uh, I was surprised as well, both that it is uh, route choices where you have an alternative on the road, but also that it is so close and uh, around the golf course here. It was a surprise for me. And I, I, I like it in a way because uh, you put uh, the runners put so much energy in, in preparing and uh, it feels a bit like a victory if you can surprise them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very true. They've done like preparation to the max. I mean, just, of course, you know, people going on training camps throughout the whole year leading up to this. Um, let's have a quick look at standings at split control number one. Simona Abersold is our current leader. You just saw Mayer Antonin uh, go into second place at that point. Vendila Hotichkova in third. But uh, Abersold has that's quite a considerable gap at this stage in the competition. Um, and let's have a look at how they've been doing that first, those first four controls. Mm, not a very good direction out from the start by uh, Simona Abersold. Much more attacking, it feels, or like more distinct by Lena Strand. Um, now Simon Abersold is hitting this small path there, which leads her to the control quite easily. Uh, but still, I, I, I think it is way around. Interesting that Lena Strand is choosing to go down to the road. Let's see if it pays off. Well, it's Just about. Well, she doesn't lose time compared to Simon Absolt. Well, later on, we will see if it's paying off uh, when you compare her to to Alexanderson. Um, and here now we are on the way to control four to the TV control. So there's still some meters to go. But uh, again, I mean, to choose to go around a lot in the beginning can give you a feeling of uh, safety and self-confidence in the very beginning. And in the long distance, you have a lot of time uh, to take risks and it's, uh, you will use a lot of energy. You know that in this kind of terrain and it can be smart to invest some seconds, but of course you have to be sure that if you go around like that, you, you're you sure that you don't lose more than five seconds. Uh, otherwise you wouldn't you wouldn't choose it, but five or 10 seconds, but uh, it can be good to invest some five, 10 seconds in the beginning to get a good feeling. Also to save some energy, you can win them back on, like on a, on a route choice like this one. We've seen here again, Lina Strand is approaching the control, punching it, she knows she has to stop. She has to stop because she didn't, didn't decide the route choice yet. Um, and then waiting until she has made her decision. And I think she's going uh, out to the asphalt street, um, to the road. The yes, one who, which wasn't very fast in the men's race, but uh, it's not the same leg here. So I think that's a good option, but we'll see. So we will get some comparison later on. So and GPS. We're in over in there, and it's Beata Friedrichs from Germany, who is our current leader. Her time, uh, 95 minutes and 48 seconds. Uh, I'm glad to see they've put some cushions there on the chair. It's really not very comfortable and kind of weirdly ankled, so that your uh, ankles, your feet are higher than your hips. Yeah, you have anyway. to be very tall to make the chair uh, comfortable. <laughs> you do. Yeah, so the, just that confirmation here, those are the standings at the finish now with, I think, maybe about 19, 20 runners at the finish. So Peter Friedrichs from Germany is uh, the current leader. It's kind of a mixture of uh, past performances at WOC and the world rankings that uh, influence that. And let's have a look at all of these ones with Alexandra Hornick as well from Poland added in. Sim uh, Simona Abersold does amazingly well to catch up and then be in the lead at control number four, com considering her yeah, I mean, misdirection she has a in the... Part of her route she chose there, uh, she's counting on that it's fast on this small path there, but and I think the route is okay, but it's the execution that's like when she was heading out from the start, it seems that she is not 100% focused, has a slightly wrong direction, and uh, it's more it's more this part I'm, I'm uh, 
yeah, I'm not very satisfied with uh, the route uh, to go around there and pick the, the small path. That's that's totally okay. Simona Appersold's uh, first world championship. She took a bronze at the European Championships last summer when they were held in Switzerland, uh, but didn't run the world championships, focusing instead on her last jaywalk. Nine jaywalk golds for her. We are now waiting for the finish of the Shepard, Great Britain. So Annika and Rima. Alvin Chiklet, number 132. Starting next is Annika start Rima. Next. EST, Estonia. With uh, 71 runners on the start line. Shepard is for sure going to take the lead here. Long distance. It's a great race. And here she comes. And at the finish, finish Joe Shepard takes the new lead. So that time... Uh, 86.51, so she goes nine minutes faster than Beata Friedrichs. She's going to be sitting in that leader's yes, chair now. So great the result range. there, Joe Shepard. Mm. We'll see how that stacks up with uh, the rest of the runners later on. And going about run walk since uh, 2004. Out to begin her long distance campaign. And then I believe we get into the, what I want to call the red group of the top 10 athletes. Let's have a look though. This, this is a mistake. Mandarina Benjaminson, yes, she's just too high there. It's not really the start you would like to have. Your world Championships on home soil. In the tail is one minute there. It was more than one minute she lost to the first or second control. Uh, Benjaminson had, I think, a stress fracture in her foot, missed the uh, first World Cup round in Finland as a result of that, but uh, done some good cross training over the winter and managed to make the team. I mean, first difficulty for a lot of the Norwegians is even making the team in the first place with a lot of great competition and everybody wanting to, to be there. Let's have a look at uh, Reza Tutor and Strand comparison. Mm -hmm. She's heading out to the power line there. So she loses quite a lot of time. A minute or just less than. Still, I think we have to wait until, uh, let's say, the coming runners now to really see if it was a good choice to go down on the road. This is Alexander Hornick here. Pole. on her way to control number four, I think. Just running further up the slope. But you can see her time there now, three minutes down on Simone Abbasold, who's the new leader at that point. Now we are at control four again. Oh, let me see the control. And we also see Hornick doing a mistake. And not, I think she knows something is wrong, but then not managed to. But she had a terrible start. I mean, she's already three and a half minutes behind. Just looking around, she hasn't and, uh, just about found it. That's what I meant. I mean, she doesn't have any self-confidence now at all. Well, let's have a look at uh, Van Hoy and Nina Strand here. Quite similar route to the first control. Both of them going down. How do you a bit more straight, or not straight, but more in uh, direction to the control? Yeah, straighter down, more diagonal down to the road. How do you take the lead away from Simone Ebersol? 
Let's see if uh, Van der Haarie will take a new leading time at control number four. So leading time still being held by Simone Abbasold of Switzerland. Here we have Simona Absolt and also Andrina Benjaminsen, I think. Mm -hmm. the two of them on their way to control number seven. Well, maybe six and then seven. And uh, certainly Simona Abbasold has caught up three minutes on Andrina Benjaminsen. Yeah, and that's a good start for Abbasold. I mean, that's a nice feedback to catch a runner. Uh, who's running in the home soil in in the, in the terrain she's used to, and uh, this will be it will like get her good self confidence for the rest of the course. So Denise Kosova of the Czech Republic, current leader at that point, split control number seven, but Abbasold goes faster by just under two minutes. It's not only that she has self confidence in her in like in the fine-tuning and orienteering, but also that she's actually able to pick the right route out of uh, different possibilities of her long route choice, and that will help her now uh, to control eight. Uh, did she wait there some seconds to see what uh, Benjamin is doing to control eight? Can be a tactic also to see what uh, the other runner is doing, because, uh, I mean, if you're not 100% sure and you have a good runner who has been top 10 uh, in the long distance before running on home soil, See what she is doing and then uh, try to keep up to her. So here we just saw Van der Haar, you go fastest by a second at the, the first split. Julia Jakob now uh, third in the long distance at the European Championships last summer. Of course, home soil for her there. Let's see how she can perform uh, here in Norway. Very different uh, terrain to contend with. Here we see what happened, happened between Abrasol and Benjaminsen. Both choose the same route here. Slightly different on the second part of the route. And Abrasol, it seems that she's running a bit faster. She actually caught her up. So this is, um, you know, real time. Yeah. So this is not synchronized time. This is how Abbasol was able to catch up Benjaminson. So, I mean, not necessarily hugely by mistakes, just just choosing those better routes through the train. Mm -hmm. I even got the feeling in the very beginning of this leg like, that uh, Benjamin Benjaminson was running a bit better out from the control, but Abbasol had a better speed and was able to catch the Norwegian. Andrine Benjaminsen. So Abbasold and Benjaminsen just through control seven. Those are the standings at that point. And uh, yeah, still as we expect, some pretty substantial gaps at that point. But let's add uh, Svetlana Miranova into the mix here on this first loop. Taking very similar routes to Van Oh, but a uh, that was not very good. I think a bit of a faff, like a few seconds lost like at, at the actual control site, maybe just missing it slightly, maybe the wrong side of the mm -hmm. null. She has quite a good speed here from control two to three, so I think she was able to win back some seconds. Here we have her in the picture, Svetlana Miranova, world champion, long distance in Italy. Back in 2014. 
So our running cams following Miranova into control number four. But uh, losing some time. Control four is just up here. She's looking at this route already, making the decision before she punches the control. So the seconds tick by. A bit special that she's <laughs> She's standing so far away from the control. I mean, usually you want to punch the con That's what you learn. You should punch the control first. Otherwise, so you don't there's forget. Yeah, uh, actually, yeah. That's, that's what you learn when you have drinking uh, controls, that you fir punch the control first and then go drinking. Because uh, there's always a risk that you forget to do it. So here is uh, favorite for today's race, Tova Alexanderson. She is a three-time defending champion and will be on the offensive around today's course. Very solid speed through the long distance. Her best discipline at foot orienteering. Of course, also a ski orienteer. She's actually best at the sprint at ski orienteering, if you can believe that. But Tova Alexanderson, yes, so she's got three gold medals in the long distance. In a row, can she make it four? Well, these Swedish fans are certainly hoping that she has a good day in the forest. But Tova Alexanderson does have a tendency to prove that she is human. Just uh, taking you back not to... Not really in the long distance. Not in the long distance, no. She, if she makes, She's more likely to make mistakes in the middle distance. Uh, things like that. But it is, you know, it is possible. Mary Thonadam from Denmark in the new Danish kit over towards control number seven. Heading towards control number seven. This part a bit more heathery, a bit more uh, bilberries and stuff on the ground as well. Oh, she's going to be over three minutes down. She comes over the top of the hill into this small re-entrance and uh, we'll go fifth there. And now there's another long leg there from seven to eight. I think more difficult to choose which way and you go on this one. And uh, Last next to start Marika from Finland, Monika Taini. She is the European middle distance champion, reigning silver medalist from the world champs last year, but doesn't tend to perform as well at the long distance is uh, today uh, her day. Back again at split two on the way to control number seven, Vandila Hochichkova of the Czech Republic, which should go faster than her teammate, Denisa Kosova. Again, some good visibility, especially on those hilltops. She's being chased around this course. Joys of Forest orienteering was 15th in the long distance uh, last year. Uh, took a top 10 in the middle back in 2017. to second place. So Abbasold still leading at that point. Again, making that decision on the route choice from control seven to eight. A lot more opportunities for some more minor mm. route choices being we taken. Have a comparison with uh, Camilla Ulausen, Wenda uh, Hario and Simona Abbasold. So those are Abbasold and Hario, ones with the two different route choices. Quite the same as episodes, both in speed and in direction. Look 
looks like an okay start for the Norwegian, Camilla Olausen. Here she is. She did it, as I said. First punch to control and then went to, go to get a drink. Best way to go, just reading that map, keeping that good line. So on her way from control three to four, crossing this little marsh at the bottom and then we'll go up. Uh, the slope towards the actual control. You can see another runner coming uh, from the other direction. This gives gives you uh, some like it gives you the feeling. Okay, there is an option to go uh, this way, so it's a bit easier to to see those three choices. Uh, at the same time, this one is quite easy to see. It's more difficult to see the one uh, straight, or even more to the to the west. Also, Camilla Olsen, she loses some seconds compared to Vendla Harju. Into fourth position, 12 seconds behind. You can see at this point she's already walking out of the control in one direction, now stopped and having a look at uh, where she's going. Lena Strand, though, uh, punches the control in the boulder, looks like number six and we'll go towards uh, control number seven where we'll get a new split time for her. And it's looking good for Lena Strand at the moment. You can see, well, look at that, control number five leading by a minute there. That's after the long leg over from controls four to five. So it'll be interesting to see where the runners have been going from that one. But Lena Strand in a good position at the moment so far. I just will make her way to control Number seven. She's got to go down, up across the top of the hill, and over the top and down into uh, a little re-entrant. And she'll be looking now at her route choice to control from control seven to control number eight. Let's have a look at her decision. Checking a punch there, makes a decision there. Let's have a look at what people have been doing from controls four to five. Mm -hmm. And that was my feeling before, that the uh, one to the to the left here, Lina Strand is choosing, is quite a good option. It's uh, more or less straight and you get this uh, quite easy entrance there. There's also a small path in this valley, which indicates that there's uh, there might have been an older track going uh, just down down uh, on the cliffs and uh, that used to be an indication that it's good to run there. Good yeah. luck, Very good there. Uh, good route choice there from Lena Strand. I'm sure we'll see lots more routes on that uh, control from four to five. But uh, now about to start we have Anastasia with Naya. So now only a few more uh, to head out into the forest. Anastasia with Naya, best result comes from 11th place 2017. And that's in the long distance. Julia Jakob, Switzerland. Control number three for her there. And directly on her way now to control number four. She's not going to be as fast as Hayo Abasold. into the last uh, few strides at the, towards control number four and goes sixth and oh, very quick out of that control this is uh, Maida Antonin and I think I think on the tracking we saw her make a mistake into control number five looks like she was going quite direct and pulled up a bit short anyway she's gone down into tenth place That's, this is what happened yep she has a wrong direction here and I mean if you have a wrong direction on this spur, 
then it's hard to see very very exactly you are. Um, you have to as as long as you have con full control and um, know where you are exactly, then you can push very hard because it's open and uh, visibility is good. But as soon as you don't really, as as soon as you lose the contact to the map, it can be really hard to relocate since there are, there isn't many there aren't many objects. And there are a lot of parallel features as well, right? Let's have a look. We've got Alexanderson on the picture in the blue and uh, Yulia Jakob as well. With uh, yeah. this for Oi, oh, that was a mistake. Alexanderson already at the first control. So there's, let's say, 20 seconds. But she has a great speed here. Yeah, you can see just yeah. how much faster she was running through the forest to control number three. So this is control number three. And let's see what happens to her by the time she gets to control number four. You could see all the speed on the GPS tracking, despite making that mm, small mistake to control number one. Looks like she just overshot it. She's going to be uh, still in a good place by the time she gets to control number four. And it's really, I mean, the speed through the terrain that makes, you know, everyone always has to look out for Alexanderson. They know she is so, so strong and um, means she's always the one to beat in uh, a long distance race, has been for you know, the last four years since her first ever um, world championship gold in Sweden. We have seen that she, I think she lost about like, let's say 20 seconds there. And now she's already back and only two seconds behind. Uh, Vendla Hariu at this fourth control. Yeah. So not the best start, but still quite okay. She's still uh, up there. So next to start, uh, Caroline Olsen. Uh, she's had a bit of a tough time leading up to these world championships with hip and heel injuries. Hasn't done many competitions uh, recently, but you know, was the third World Cup uh, Norway 2018 in the suit. She has great form on this type of terrain and uh, did take her first win in the World Cup final middle distance in the Czech Republic. So it's going to be a bit of an unknown, I think, from Carolyn Olsen. She certainly does have the potential. Jo Shepard enjoying her stay in the leader's chair. Now we can follow Simone Abersold. We're close to split control number three. That's control number 10. As we, where we've seen um, a lot of the men go as well. That was one of the TV control points on the men's course. A section of quite open, quite visible forest. And Abersold, of course, uh, her first year as a senior, starting fairly early on, She's not accumulated that many world ranking points. And um, she's definitely the fastest one in the forest at the moment. Let's see where she is approaching. She's behind one of those trees as she makes her way. I think um, she was on the way to control nine before. And now uh, turning soon to control 10. Indeed, she punched control nine, I think. I think that was Isia Vasse we just saw through uh, yeah. control three. But she's now lost. coming out on a path here. So we just head into the forest directly, and she should appear here in this picture very soon. Where is she? There she is. And she's uh, lost Andrina Benjaminson as well. Yeah, that's true. So Abersold, that leads two minutes and seven seconds. The lead compared to, I don't know, it's kind of not gaining much time on the likes of Denisa Kosova, who's that current second place. But Andrina Benjaminson yet to reach that point. We're looking for Marie Katani, there she is. In the white and blue of Finland towards uh, control number four. But already late at this control 
with still the leader at that point, Ven the Hayu of Finland. By <laughs> only one second, we should say. Marika Taney lost time here. She's checking her roots. The long leg control four to five. And keeps running. Okay. So she's the first one really or one of the only few we've seen to uh, leave the control in that direction mm, there's I mean it's still minutes. hard to say Coming where she's the headed but there's uh, there's the an Czech option Republic. there that you it's head out the here, from the control in the same direction as we have seen uh, Kasper Foster doing minutes. in the men's race and then go quite a straight uh, route as uh, Simona Appersold or uh, Andrine Benjaminson was uh, choosing. Yeah, and Andrine Benjaminson gone into fourth place at uh, control number 10. So Sabine Hauser at there. Uh, Simone Appersol. Yeah. And here we have uh, Rutnaya in the picture going up to this path, as we have seen Appersol doing. Going straight here. Seems to be a quite a uh, good start for Rutnaya. Oh, I don't think that's necessary to round the green area there. There should be a path by now. And it was quite nice going through the open area there. Some of the open area is recently felled and quite grotty. That open area was really nice and really runnable. You can also see the difference in the speed uh, between Alexanderson and Rutnaya. So Venahayu here, she punches the control at number six and on her way to number seven where we're going to get the new split time. Reminder, we saw Lena Strand take the new leading time at that point, but you can see already with a the clue there, control number five, one minute, 27 seconds she's lost between controls four and controls five, and that will be on the route choice. We saw that Lena Strand was able to gain time over Simona Abasol by taking the route that went uh, on the road, which went to the, west, to the east, sorry, of the line, of the red line. But Ven Lahayu has lost time here. Once again, those route choices proving decisive. It's very surprising for me that we don't see more runners choosing the route uh, we have seen Lina Strand choosing. Uh, for me, it's the most obvious one uh, because it's it's you have uh, this passage of one kilometer asphalt running, which is more or less going into the right direction. Uh, so that's very obvious when you check the map, and uh, for the other one you, you have actually to look out for uh, to find it. So f I'm a bit surprised. And then after the, when you leave the r the road, you get this passage in the valley, so it, there's no risk to lose direction. Let me see the difference here. Yeah, uh, she's choosing. A middle option, something between Abersold and Strand. I would say that uh, the one Lina Strand was choosing seems to be the best to me. Yeah, she just stays for longer on that road. And what Hayu was doing, she had to have that climb. She basically went over the top of the hill. Like, it's not a huge hill, but uh, she certainly lost time and then also didn't have quite that same entrance into the control, which means running, you know, along the long line of crags. Uh, a good handrail, good line feature to uh, hold on to as we see yet uh, Mariana Anderson starts. She got a medal from the walk along last time it was organized in Norway in 2010. As we add uh, Olsen into the mix on the routes to control, all the way to control number four. Seems to go be a good start. Losing some seconds there out from the control. And also doing a mistake there. Oops. Yeah. She lost, let's see, maybe 40 seconds. Running a bit too high in the hill there. And then the Hario has Again, lost one and a half minutes uh, to the start. We have the, the penultimate starter. 
Natalia Gempeler, who at last five. year's World Championships took her first ever world title, is in the middle distance. She does have a silver and a bronze from previous World Championships in the long, though, as well. And always a contender whenever she we starts will a race. Just make a short break in the latest competition and, and give of course you it was the, the first uh, individual uh, world title. It was uh, she was world champion in the relay okay, before. Okay, well, individual world title. Have to be precise here. I Kat. do. I know. Otherwise, people will pick me up on it. Rightly so. Yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Sara Hagstrom is the last starter. She will be chasing the rest. 24 year old. And uh, is it a bit nervous when you're the last starter? Do you think that's going to pile up? Extra pressure on well, there? I, I think it's a special feeling to be the last one in the quarantine, at least, uh, when you're all alone there. I've uh, been waiting all day. I mean, the competition started at 10 o'clock or 20 past 10, so the runners had to be in the quarantine for six and a half hours now, or she had to be in the quarantine for six and a half hours, and that's quite a long time. And it's, I don't know if, if it's more nervous, but it's of course uh, a nice feeling. It's of course good to go out. Oh, that's nice. She's talking to herself. I think that she was talking to herself. That's a very good method to keep focus. Let's see if we can hear. Keep on listening. <laughs> it's a very good method if you Oof. want to run uh, in a prospective way, when you want to be ahead with your map reading, it's very good that you talk to yourself what you want to see. Uh, and it's the risk that your thoughts will get away from the orienteering to something totally else you, want, you don't want to have in your head uh, is much less. And at the same time, you can secure that you always are ahead of with your orienteering because you, you hear what you're saying and then it's more it's more believable and you first have to think the thing you're actually saying could you make I, out anything, I know, could I you know. make out anything that she was saying no was it's a bit she's a bit too far not. away okay uh, yeah. but she took a, a remarkably long time to make that decision and we could really see that she was checking out all the options yeah, but it, i mean it's an important decision yeah exactly right. yeah <laughs> She was really properly looking at all the options and trying to spot everything as, you know, there are four, three, four different options that you can take. So we have it here. Uh, this is control number three. And we saw her, uh, her tracking earlier there. Time is running out a little bit there for Sabine Hassert. Early days, though, and if you're still within a minute of the lead, I reckon yeah. it's possible. Of course, uh, we have seen Tove Alexander through this point so far. Are you sure that it was Kelly Nilsson we heard uh, talking and not the cameraman or the camera woman? No. We will never know. You have to <laughs> ask her. <laughs> so how goes joint night there, joint with Yulia Jakob. And she'll just make that choice. This is Athena Thrand, and we're over towards uh, controls nine and ten now. And you can see that time 
the time advantage she had over Simone Abersold at control seven was 1.14. It's a little bit less than that now, uh, but she's quite close to this control. This is control number 10 on the women's course. If you're uh, also watching the GPS alongside our live stream. And then to take a good line here, but a new leading time, leading time. 5.59 seconds. Let's have a look at route choices, though, from control 7 to 8. Hmm. This one is going very much to the west there. Almost exactly on the blue route. Abersol is... Uh, I mean, she's doing a lot of distance there when she's running around on the, on the path. Second part of the route is okay, I think, but the first uh, first part, I, I would, I think it would have been better to keep to the green option. And here it seems that she tries to avoid this cutting area, Simon Absolut. Not really choosing the most direct option. Mm. Interesting those route choices there. We're good to see when more of the runners get at that point. Mm. And Anderson here. This is two split one. Well, this is control number three with the drinks. Taking on some liquids already, getting that line across to control uh, number four. And you can see she's already late. Got a bit wetter through there. Mm, she seems to have lost quite a lot of time in the beginning. I guess she's done a small mistake somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure we'll catch that on the GPS once she makes her way to this point. You know what, I think it was the cameraman speaking. <laughs> or us. Let's we know, last yeah, at control seven. And it's four and a half minutes place. behind. It's quite a bit. So she lost, uh, yeah, she lost two and a half minutes here. You see that uh, Tue Alexanderson is going around as well. Same as Lina Strand, and running a bit faster there, it seems. That looks good so far. Well, we don't really see them in the picture, now we see that. Yeah, so live with Alexanderson there, you can yeah. see she's in a lead at control number Say five. Approximately min one minute. Uh, soon we will have her in the picture on the way to control seven. I guess it's this picture. Yes, indeed. At control six. Yep, six and she's on her way to number seven. So caught up Julia Jakob by three minutes. Mm, Julia Jakob came from a strange direction there. She must have done a mistake. But this will be a clear lead for Tove Alexanderson here. making it look very easy through this terrain. And very shortly into uh, control 
Number seven. Uh -huh. We still see Julia Jakob, and I mean, this is... Uh, you would like to, to keep up to Tuve there, because uh, at the moment she's three minutes and five seconds behind, and uh, on in fifth position. So, um, if you keep that uh, train there, then you yeah. might end up with a medal today. As a runner, you want you want to start three minutes ahead of Tober Alexanderson. I think you possibly do. <laughs> on the long distance, anyway. This is Natalia Kempeli. Let's see how her start into the race was. Not very good, as it seems. Already now 35 seconds behind. So she must have done a mistake in the beginning. So Gempeler, second to last starter. Opening the map up to check the route choice. Uh, gonna survey all the options. Now she should head off towards the left, and she does. But still, there's still, even if, so she's made the right decision by heading left. I think she would have lost a lot of time if she's decided to head right, but then you still got to execute, choose the right route choice for the rest of the leg as well. Let's have a look at these routes. Gempeler, see where she's lost some time. Alexanderson, of course, she made that miss there. Axtrum did it quite well here in the beginning. Well, she's going so much down, she could have uh, went all the way. Gempeler just losing the wait, What is, her? Oh, okay, her GPS stopped there. So no obvious mistakes from Gempeler no. there. And glued on the line, for the most part. So we are, we'll be waiting for Sal Hagstrom at uh, control number four. She's the last starter. She's the only one we're waiting for, as uh, you might expect. So we're still waiting for the Swede Sada Hagstrom at control three, four. This is on the way to number four. Uh, looking for the distinctive uh, colours of Sweden. Yeah. Oh, I think we can hear somebody coming up there. Just see how time ticks by. Might be a cameraman again. No. <laughs> Here she is. Again, from a strange direction, my opinion. Yes, if, if we didn't see her, um, even to the left of the picture. See, some parts, I think, like through marshes like this, started to track up. You can really see a little bit underfoot. And now goes up the slope towards control number four. So now more than a minute behind there for Sarah Hagstrom. 18th. And she's got all the chasing to do, nobody to catch her. So these are the standings then, with all the runners through this point. Ben Lahayu still that leading time, but we know she lost time on the first long leg. And again, those top 20 still within uh, 70 seconds. Caroline Olsen, though, down in 20th position. Not the best start for the Swede. Here's Marie Katani. Marie Katani was 26 seconds behind at the first TV control. Lost just under two minutes from, from controls four to five. 
but still within touching distance of Abasold, though. So we've got to consider that um, Alexanderson has gone a minute and 23 seconds faster than Lena Strand. into that third place, 20 seconds ahead of Abasolt, who is uh, quite close to finishing this course, actually, Simona Abasolt. Now let's have a look then at some of these routes and maybe we can see why Marie Cataini lost two mm -hmm. minutes. As we saw in the beginning, she was taking the same uh, way out from the control as we have seen Casper Foster taking. Oh, and then she is going all the way around to the orange option. Well, she obviously lost some time there, uh, at least compared to, to Alexanderson, and also compared to Lina Strand. But it was, I would say, a little bit faster than Simona Abersold's route. Yes, indeed, some seconds she was. Mm, she, was, she was already some seconds behind at control number four, so uh, Abersol lost time there. And uh, also here, I think Abersol is losing time, going quite uh, straight out from the control instead of uh, taking the same direction as Marika Taini. So Denise Kosova is the new leader at the finish. She's gone. 4 minutes 44, faster than Joe Shepard. So 1, tw one hour 22.07 uh, for her 82.07. So those times definitely going to creep under that 80 minutes. I think could go way under those 80 minutes. That was the initial expected winning time uh, from today's competition. Yeah, let's have a look at confirmation. So 4 minutes 44 seconds faster than Joe Shepard. Evely Kasku from Estonia has uh, gone into that bronze place. Great result from Anacela Junga Arquez from Spain. Fourth place currently. It's pretty impressive. And the New Zealander Lizzie Ingham uh, held an athlete has gone into sixth place as well. Lizzie Ingham's actually done a lot of uh, racing in the UK this year, some using it as a way to get away from some of the Norwegian terrain. I mean, you know, done a lot of training in this terrain, but sometimes I think it was, it's nice to have a bit of a break and she uh, was competing in the, the Scottish Six Days uh, maybe to, you know, refresh, have a little bit of a refresher beforehand. Here we have it. Uh Rutnaya, choosing the same option as we have seen uh, Marika Taining choosing. Let's see if it's paying off. It's about the same result as before. Rutnaya was a bit more. Oh, no, she was actually she actually lost some time there compared to Taini, so she was not as fast as Taini on yeah. the same route. Yeah, it didn't look like she executed that quite as well. Like speed wise, um, exactly. Yeah, and you can really see that difference losing uh, just under those three minutes on that route choice. It didn't do too much damage for Marie Kataini, but so it looks like it has done for Rudnaya. Well, it's still an okay start for Rudnaya, I think. Um, but I, I, I'm really surprised that we only, I think we've only seen Strand and Alexanderson choosing. The one around on the on the road. So here into the finish, we have the Swiss athlete. We have first year senior Simona Abersold, and she will go into a new leading time here. She's going to knock Denise Kosova off that huge green leader's chair, and uh, a relatively early starter Abersold will complete her course here. 
Still the second fastest to uh, control number four. Putting together her first performance at the World Championships. And it's uh, all the way to the line to take the lead by over six minutes. So 75-50. Great result for Simona Abersold. She's going to have a wait to see who will be able to challenge that if we look at uh, control at number seven. She's in fourth place. Now we are back at control 10. I think we're looking for, yes, Svetlana Mironova, the Russian. Through this section, a very clear forest, as um, said before, the, the cameras like to pick out the uh, nicer areas of forest, uh, the areas that are um, maybe that a bit more visible. So not it's not all like this. Mironova was too. actually four minutes behind Lina Strand. At the second TV control, so she did a very good part here. So now, control seven and ten. So Hauswitz is another one who's chosen to run around a very yeah. Swiss route, as we've been saying, and looks like she's executing it reasonably well. Let's see. So Alexanderson, look how fast, much faster she was. One minute thirteen she's on that leg. Staying down under a cliff there, and I think that's quite okay to do. So it hasn't got to that point yet. We're live with her now. She's on her way to control number five, and then we can get uh, an estimate of her split time from control four to five. Although I think we have a pre-warning at five, so we can get it exactly and figure out mm, whether and she we see that, to do that uh, correctly. The two Swedish runners, they were 40 seconds faster. Well, almost two minutes. Alexanderson was almost two minutes faster, but uh, it's at least 40 seconds faster. Now we have Sabina Hauswirt at the pre-warning. So, yep, she's uh, taken 148 on that leg, so not quite as fast as Strand, and I think that's probably the last part mm, of the leg that she's maybe lost out there. But still... Part of it, maybe some, one part is also the speed. We don't know that. camera by control six and seven we'll see her soon but let's have a look at this route choice from control eight this is as if they all started at the same time strand of course we saw going out to uh, the area of open alexanderson she stuck much closer to the line mm, and i think that's a good decision same uh, for Hario also keeping close to the line and here we are with to Alex Anderson on the way to the well ninth control, I guess. And if you just look at the uh, split times there, gaining three minutes on that long leg for between control seven and control eight. Goodness me! And, and the thing is that no one else came closer, Lina Strand there uh, before, or uh, not from the top five at least. Maybe a little bit, but I mean three minutes. <laughs> it's just, it's quite a difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, understatement of, of the day, <laughs> of maybe of the week, yeah. Three minutes to gain there is um, something else. So she drops down. Here, visibility increases and she'll go down the slope towards the actual control. Crossing over the track there. And then get visibility early on on the control, gives you some confidence. Found another one tick. Get that great feedback. <laughs> Just look how fast she's able to get through that terrain on her way down there. Just that power and the leg speed that she has. It's 
been Hazret here. She's just gone into fifth place at um, control number seven. There she is making the route choice to control number eight. So Alex Anderson was able to gain three minutes on that. Is Hasseth able to do anything similar? So she's 2.42 behind Alex Anderson at that point. But you see third, fourth, fifth, sixth even, uh, quite close together. There's still um, a lot to go with as we said, first of all, that long route choice into control number eight. And then it's going to be about keeping it clean around the last part of the course when you're feeling tired and the concentration starts to go. Here's Lena Strand. She's towards control 18. Mm. We had a 32 seconds gap before the last TV control. How big's the gap now? A bit more. 34 seconds now. So those huge deficits that you had that she had there on the screen is because Tova Alexanderson had got to those points and gone faster than her. Those uh, 32 seconds that she was in the lead, that's ahead of uh, Simona Abersold. And then into the last few controls. No uh, biggie here. Not too difficult to execute, but uh, we can say that anything can happen. Jakob here. But I mean, uh, the fact that it was a three minutes gap on this uh, on one route there between control seven and eight opens up very much for runners who lost time in the beginning to the first control. I'm thinking about uh, Natalia Kempene, for example. She was uh, almost a minute behind at the first TV control, and I mean, she only loses two minutes compared to Alexanderson, then she can win back that minute uh, compared to Lina Strand. So uh, the medal race is much more open, <laughs> uh, if you think of that. Uh, not really the race for the gold medal, though. I doubt it. But let's see. I mean, we have seen mistakes before, um, but it's a big, a big lead at the moment. So this is control uh, 10, or on the way to control number 10. This is track before control number 10, and then uh, Yulia Jakob will make her way down to the control, which is just, just out of frame there. And you know, the, the, the time gap is big, but you do have to remember that Alex Anderson is about four minutes faster than Nina Strand in second place at this point. So she is six minutes down, but still in touching distance of, um, well, top three finish. And she's only 24 seconds behind uh, Simon Aversol. Yeah, confirmation there, those standings at that control you just seen, control number 10. Four and a half minute lead for Alex Anderson. So yeah, Lena Strandsom and Aversol Julia Jakob and high even there. Uh, I mean, quite close still, although, you know, they've they've done that long leg from seven to eight where Alexanderson gained those three minutes. And then if anyone's in there, you can see uh, nine minutes, 50 seconds down there, which she was caught by Simone Abersold and overtaken. Here we can compare Marianne Andersen to Alex Andersson and Simona Aversold. And uh, yeah, it's not the best route Andersson was choosing. She had to do a lot of climbing there. I think it was better to go around as uh, Simona Aversold was doing it. Uh, and we knew already from the beginning that you lose time if you don't go to the left or to the, to the east and choosing the asphalt road there. This Norwegian terrain not suiting the Norwegians, or this is the course not suiting the Norwegians, I think. I don't know, I I don't think that they expected it to be so much route choices where you can go around. So it's more about that they, when they planned the tactics that they said, it's when you have the, the routes you keep close to the line, which ac actually was a good option on the second long leg. 
But if you have a route choice like this, where you can't keep to the line, it might be better to go around. And they might not have been prepared so well for, for this exercise, to, to choose a, a route that is going extremely much around. Anderson goes 14 at only control number seven. What? Oh, nearly missing there, but this is Lena Strand into the finish alongside that was Vandila Hotichkova there too. Andrina Benjaminson is also there as well, but actually it's going to be reasonably close with Simona Abbasold. Jonas is shaking his head, he doesn't think so. Uh, Lena Strand in here, so punch one more control and then into the finish. Strand in great shape at the moment, but quite an early start compared to the rest of the top runners. But to take over the lead ahead of Abersold is a good achievement. And uh, there's Abersold just watching, she's about to be dethroned by the Swede, who goes all the way to the finish, cheered on, lots of Swedish support here from just across the border, and Lena Strand all the way, fighting to the line. And as Jonas points out, an easy win there, the new leading time for Lena Strand, 75-16. And we also have Vandila Hotchkova into third place as well. Mm, and, uh, well, I don't know, but it seems, for me, it's the time loss to control eight. It's very big three minutes. Uh, we haven't seen, I mean, there are, as you said, there are quite many runners following now. I think it will be tight for the medals. Three minutes is very much time. And uh, as we see here, for example, it opened up for Marit Katani. She was uh, 50 seconds more than now. Uh, yeah, more than 50 seconds behind at the second TV control, and now uh, behind Lina Strand, and now she is in front of her. So uh, I don't know if she opened the window there a little bit too much. I think I mean maybe you see the the route choice that goes quite extremely round to control number five, and then that opens your mind up for looking for further round route choices. Yeah, but at the same time, she can't know that, she, that that was a good route choice because she doesn't get any time feedback. So, uh, <laughs> and, and the next route choice is coming very quickly. You, don't, you just have to control six and control seven, and, and then you have again a long route. And um, I don't think that she got the feedback there at control five that she knew that this one must have been the best route. So this is as if they all started at control four together. And we can have a look at uh, what happens to the runners here. Alexanderson, her speed is so high and ends up winning that leg by 30, one minute and 13 seconds. But if you exclude to Alexanderson here, so the, the gap in the route choice is 30 seconds, mm -hmm. or a bit more because Hausweg did the same barely the same. Yeah. Um, but on the other route, it was three minutes, and mm. okay, then you have Alexanderson again. So let's say it's two minutes, but still, it's it's the difference is bigger on the second one. So Alexanderson going through the arena here. We can say that she's punched control number 13, I think 13, five minutes and 36 seconds ahead of Lena Strand. So Tova Alexanderson will, able, will be able to get some good feedback. She chooses to listen to it from the supporters as they make their way around there. She just passes in front of our commentary position. And look at those gaps, just gaining seconds the whole way around. Mm, we saw the small mistake at the first control, but ever since then, uh, she did a great performance here. And I mean, what should happen? Five and a half minutes. I mean, we have still got to wait and see some of the others, uh, how close they're able to get. Um, but yeah, that's 
pretty unassailable lead. So back now at split two, that's control number seven. In fact, that's control number six, you can see there, I think, on the boulder. And um, waiting for the last starter, Sarah Hagstrom. We've had Natalia Gempel into that point. She's gone 12th fastest, 4.44 down. Here's Hagstrom. Good direction there, and let's have a look at the time. past the boulder into this re-entrant. No problems there. That's 17th position there for the final starter. So with the uh, start of Hagstrom through that point, let's have a look at the standings. So Tove Alexanderson, leader her, her lead at that point, 123. Marika Taney also uh, in Good position there, and uh, with good, she had a good long leg. Quite the green part of the forest here. I don't know, the cameraman is trying to find Stasia Rutnaya in here. on her way to control number 10, but uh, dropping okay. time. In fact, oh, here's this the track. Is the path. Anyway, let's move back to the finish. May Rantanen here. And she will go fifth. 10 minutes down on Lena Strand, who's the current leader. Tough day in the forest for May Rantanen, one of uh, several Finns who was uh, had a period of maternity leave last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anastasia Rutnaya punched control 10 in seventh position, six minutes 56 seconds behind. So Ven Lahai there just went through control 18, 313 down. I think lost a bit of time actually between controls 10 and uh, no, between, between the arena and control 18. Cecilia Jacob though. This is the arena passage for her. So if we look at the arena, she's gone through there in fifth. Eight minutes down on uh, Tova Alexanderson. Two and a half minutes down on uh, Lena Strand. Yeah, about two minutes slower than Simona Abersold, who at the Arena Passage is currently in third place. So the Swiss cowbells are rung. For Yulia Jakob. And just the last loop for her, still left to run. Of course, she you can say she didn't manage to stay with uh, Alexanderson when Alexanderson caught up and overtook her. Would have been an impressive feat if she had. Let's have a look. We are synchronized here. 
these routes and Strand and Taney very close together. This is on the way to Control 11. Mm. Mm. And this is the, the route choice that uh, it's a Londoners route. took. All of them are choosing to go around. And it seems that Lina Strand has quite a good speed there. Know that London S, he was heading up into the forest there a bit earlier. All three of them are choosing to go all the way around. This will be a close battle here between Strand and Taney. We had a little bit bad direction out from the control there. So let's check the speed choice. And this is very decisive in my opinion now. Especially the comparison between Strand, Hauswirt, Taini. But uh, Hauswirt, she doesn't really take the chance there. She's choosing the same option as Lina Strand. So we know Taini gained about 50 seconds on Lina Strand from Control 7 to. 10 and then I think has lost some time again. She's about to go through the mm -hmm. arena. Here we have Kali Nolson. A bit more than seven and a half minutes behind. Yeah, punching the controller in, in ninth and but three minutes slower over like three and a half. Yeah, just over three minutes slower than Marie Katani at that point. Greenhouse is also on her way towards control uh, number 10. It's shown up on our pre warnings, of course. You can see looking at the splits there from control 7 to 8, going from 2.42 down to 5.58. A uh, really decisive leg. Well, decisive for Alex Anderson anyway. Control 10 for the Swiss runner. There she is. Pretty good on foot at this point okay. in that small <laughs> depression, just reassuring herself. Talking. That was her talking to herself then, just saying, okay, okay. Another control down, another one to go. Here though, Alexanderson. And she's on her way to control number 18. Which is split number four. And she goes six minutes and 21 seconds. Wah! Yeah, that would have been needed an abysmal mistake now to, to actually lose that uh, advantage here. Six and a half minutes, I mean, that's, that's not going to happen. Ben Lahayu here into the finish. The fin and see where she's able to place compared to the rest. Well, you can see there she's already uh, behind Strand and Abersold. Uh, she'll fit nicely into that big gap ahead of Hotichkova, whose run is standing up quite well at the moment. So Ben Lahayu into the finish. Turn from maternity leave where last year she was sitting watching the GPS results, wishing she was in the forest. Well, she's back to the forest there. She's going to take the new third fastest time. Four minutes slower than Strand. 
so we thought Strand was in a bit of trouble with uh, that root choice, I think, on control to control eight. But actually, the longer still it don't looks... don't know how Natalia Gamble went That's on it. Uh, I think that Sarah Hoekström is out of the fight. Um, so Gamble is still has a, a chance. Marika Taini and uh, Lina Strand. I think it's those three women fighting for the medals. Uh, behind uh, to Alexanderson, of course. Of course. So let's have a look at these standings. Simone Abbasol, though, at 34 seconds behind Nina Strand. Van Hai, she's just come in. Then, uh, yeah, none of the rest of those women are going to feature, I think, on the, the podium as we see the best through. So let's have a look at uh, some of this replay, looking at Strand and Taney in particular. So Taney and Gempeler, we think some of the two that could potentially uh, challenge. Um, for the medals, different route choices mm -hmm. taken here, going out along, uh, there's a lot of golf course here, it's quite nice to run on, quite nice on the fairways, uh, and, but Strand, so we're live with Marika Taney, uh, but Strand still holding that leading position of the three of them, you know, Tova Alexanderson excluded, uh, seems to be the theme of this women's race. So it'll be a little bit of a nervous time for Lena Strand to see whether uh, Marie Cattani is able to catch her. Of course, we haven't seen much of the end of Strand's route uh, to see uh, how she progresses through those four controls quite close together, a bit of a control pick uh, towards the end. This is Marianne Anderson, though, the Norwegian. She's on her way to control number 10. So this is um, after that route, this route choice control seven to eight that's proved pretty decisive. So I think by the time we see them here, we know who's going to be in contention or not. And look, losing three minutes again between controls seven and eight, that's where Alexanderson has had, well, she's had a fantastic run the rest of the way around, apart from control number one, which was only a tiny miss. Um, so just moving here, through here very shortly at control number 10. Very strong, very experienced runner. A lot of world championships under her belt. Great to see her back on this team on home soil. Not her first World Championships on home soil. Got a medal last time in 2010. Now I think uh, we see Tove Alexanderson coming to the arena. We do indeed the familiar, very familiar figure of Tova Alexanderson. And you can look at her time at control 20, still six minutes, 17 seconds in the lead. And Tova Alexanderson just has running left to do now on the final stage of this tough long distance course. She is a specialist in this terrain. And with such a gap, there is not a possibility of anybody being able to catch, to catch her unless they have a teleportation machine. But uh, she, Punches that last control. We are waiting now at the finish to see her take her fourth gold medal in a row in the long distance. She is so dominant over this discipline. And another masterclass performance in orienteering from Tova Alexanderson. Gold medal number four in the long distance. Smile on her face says everything little fist pump there and she well the victory that margin over Lena Strand is enough for us to know she is uh, not even remotely the last starter and we can already say there is no possibility of I anybody mean, catching it, her. It feels like no one that 
neither uh, Olav Lundenes or uh, Tove Alexander som wants to let go the streak here. <laughs> Four times in a row for both of them. Let's see what happens in two years. But uh, as you said, this was a very impressive run. We have seen a small mistake at the first control. Uh, it almost seemed that she, after that, was very very focused. Maybe not, uh, it was like an alarm bell ringing in her head. Now we have, I have to be focused. I can actually do mistakes in this kind of terrain. But after that, I mean, we haven't seen anything, any problems at all. And uh, the Rue Choice 7-8 is just impressive. So we just saw Natalia Gempeler through control 10 in ninth place, 7.22 behind Alexanderson. More importantly, that is about three minutes slower than Marie Cataney and Lena Strand. So we are now focused on Strand and Taney for the medals, I think. Yeah, I, I, I mean, both of them have a medal. The question is which color? Which color? Yeah. Uh, so uh, here it looks. Uh, that Strand has an advantage by, let's see, 10, 15 seconds. No mistakes for Strand or Taney there. So see a result quite close to Marika Taney. Of course, we shouldn't forget uh, Abersold, but she was uh, more than 40 seconds behind Strand in the finish. Yes, we're about live now with mm -hmm. Monika Taney. So she's on her way to control 16. We've had her at the pre-warning. So we're going to see her at control 18. But uh, we also see that Strand was actually five seconds faster than Alexanderson from control 18 to the finish. Um, so I don't really think that Taney will uh, pass Lina Strand. And maybe there is even a chance for Simona Absolt to actually fight for the bronze medal. Let's see. Uh, can, uh, Carolyn Olsen has just passed through the arena. She's 8 minutes 32 slower than Alexanderson again, just under like 3 minutes slower than Lena Strand. But now uh, tracking of Taney is up to her now to see what colour medal she will get. I mean, there is a possibility that she will go slower than Aversold too. We will wait and see. So we're now waiting for Marie Cataney at control 18. I think that's... It's not her. No, that's Annika Rima. There she is, I think. Yeah. Yep. So let's have a look. So the gap Taney and Strand, that's what we're after. My feeling is that the gap is too big here. I mean, we have, if you look at the map, it's more or less just running left from Control 18. And uh, 20 seconds is quite a big gap if, we, if you have to close it by just running, by just speed. Um, of course, she knows the situation. I'm sure she knows about the situation that they were very close to each other at the Rima Passage, but still 20 seconds. To run 20 seconds faster and about 1k, I don't see that happen, really. Last start at Hagstrom into Control 10 down in 14th place. So that should be all the runners through at control number 10 now. Everyone's managed to negotiate that um, long leg from seven to eight. Oh, we've seen lots of people losing time. Sabine Hasselt also threw in the arena and she's in sixth place. So yeah, these are the standings though. At control number 10 with the um, Hagstrom through. See, at that point, Taney just four seconds faster than Strand. Some maybe disappointment for Carolyn Olsen down in 11th, Camilla Olsen down in equal 12th. 
at that point. So now we are waiting to see Strand and Taney. So we know at control number 18, Strand has a 21 second advantage. Let's see what happens on this last second. Mm. So you said Strand was five seconds quicker than Alexanderson. Yeah, this and spot. the gap between Taney and Ebersol was 13 seconds. But here it's definitely not 13 seconds anymore. This is Camilla Olausen on the way to the last control and to finish. Camilla Olausen, uh, is, she took a top five in every Forest World Cup race last year in 2018. I think she'll be quite disappointed with her result here. She will be pushed off the podium, I think, in the end. 12 minutes slower than Alexanderson. Will she just go faster than uh, Czech Kuchichkova, who's had a really fantastic run? Uh, no, she won't. So can we look for Larson? go into sixth place currently there's a podium finish currently but she will slip further down the rankings and um, I think a lot of expectations on this lady's shoulders she will uh, look at that Ooh. now Abasold is ahead of Marika Taney into control number 19 so possibility now for the Swiss to get two bronze medals today it's going to come down to the last few controls to what will be a sprint and um, I think Marika Taney will have possibly the advantage there she knows she's got she will know when she gets into the arena she'll have a time to meet she'll get that feel from uh, from the arena from everybody in the arena and um, Lena Strand's silver is looking um, more and more convincing it will be her first individual gold medal at the world championships Yulia Jakob in here. She will go fifth. Swiss runner, but look at those margins down from Alexanderson. And even then, also uh, Strand and uh, Abbasolt, who had comparatively early starts compared to these lot, especially with that three minute start interval. It makes it's a long day for those uh, watching. So, with Yulia Jakob in the finish, only a few runners left. You remember, she was caught up and overtaken by Alexanderson. Now, let's see. Now we are waiting for Marika Tene very soon to this second last control. Yeah, this second last control just on the sand. She is late compared to Lina Strand. I'm uh, really sure about that. But the uh, question is, will she beat Simona Abersolt? Will she get, get the bronze medal or not? Here she is. So Marika Taney here. She's racing for the bronze medal. Yeah. Let's have a look. Simona Abersold is six minutes and 50 seconds behind. So, so 50 seconds to go. It's going to be super close here for the Finn. There's also Miranda Anderson. No. Yep. Yes, Miranda Anderson in there chasing two. But Marika Taney here. So this is her time. She's now slower than Strand. Strand gets that silver with Gempela out of it as well. The rest of the finish is out of it too, but this final seconds, 25 seconds there to make it to the finish. She goes up this hill. She, all the finish flags I can see are waving from the spectators in this fantastic arena, but she's got uh, just over 10 seconds to make it. Marika Taney fighting for a medal here. It's going to be too late for the Finn who just let it go right at the end of her race. That's the time. Abbasold gets the bronze. Marika Taney into the finish. She's fighting for seconds now and ends up in that fourth spot. 7.02, so 12 seconds slower than Abbasold in the end. It should be a podium finish for her. 
and collapses there. She was in such a good position. She was in that bronze medal position, but not quite that speed at the end of that long distance course. So on uh, Simone Abbasod's debut uh, at Wok, she gets uh, a bronze medal. Let's have a look at the final stages. We can see there Abbasod just ahead at that point. But the gap must you could, grow. You could get the feeling earlier that Marika Tainy must have been tired since, I mean, she was uh, in front of uh, Lina Strand at uh, third TV control. And then uh, she didn't do any mistakes, but she lost second for second uh, compared to Lina Strand. And uh, then you got the feeling, okay, she, she might be tired. And in the beginning, I, I didn't even notice that there would be a chance for Simona Abersol, but uh, it was about the same as for Casper Foster in the end. It's just not, th she didn't have uh, the energy left, which would have been needed to get the medal. Um, yeah, and now the first year senior, Simona Abersson is taking the bronze. Yeah, the second senior bronze yeah. after the European Championships. Yeah, but there it was more. It was more dramatic, it was when uh, we first thought that Julia Jakob would have won the race and then she got, got disqualified, yeah. That was a race full of drama. This one a little bit more, well, more plain sailing for Alexanderson here. And Still some drama though. Talking about this uh, middle race, uh, in this race Marie Cantaini was the lucky one with the seconds, in this race today she wasn't. But that's still Marika, it'll still be Marika Taney's best result in the, in yeah, the long distance result. I mean, if uh, for you her individually, you know. Taking count, it's not, uh, I would say, see her more as a middle specialist than a long distance specialist. And uh, the fourth place here is, uh, she will get definitely, she will definitely get uh, self-confidence out of it and uh, take this with, me, uh, with her uh, to the mis middle distance final. So we're waiting here for Carolyn Olsen. We've also had pre one Sabine Housework to this point. This is control number 18. So Carolyn Olsen was fifth last starter. Here she is. can always feel that she's she's quite tired yeah. and uh, she's not she d doesn't see the control now so she's not really doing the job to work all the way to the control and that's a typical thing that happens when you're tired you get close to the control and then you just you're too tired to really read the map again when you actually should do it and uh, it's very typical then you just keep on running and get a bit insecure here we see that uh, the only one going straight is Sabine Hauswirt. She's too far behind to fight for the medals at this point. And I don't remember any mistakes by Simona Abbasol, so um, she would need to just run more than a minute faster here on the last loop. She's choosing another route here. But still more than a minute up to the medal place. It's hesitating a little bit into control 15. Here she's coming to towards control 18. And you see the difference is uh, more than two minutes. But still a chance for top six. Yeah, absolutely. She's gonna go 
looks like she's going to go faster than Hayu, as long as she doesn't make the kind of little miss that we saw from uh, Olsen. No problems there. Just trying to keep it together at the end of this long, long race. Tove Alexanderson's time, actually 69 minutes flat. It's going way under our expected winning times. So there were three runners in the forest after, after Hauswit. But now waiting for Rudnaya at the finish. Can she get herself on the podium? I think she, yeah, she will just be too late. It's going to be close between her and Caroline Olsen. Just looking out here into the terrain. They cross the road, come to, down through this forest. There she is, just can see the flash of the number. I think it's been quite nice to have the names written on the numbers. That's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> what are you suggesting? <laughs> I think it's good for the spectators as well. And uh, hopefully we'll get more, even more spectators at the finish um, for the middle and definitely for the relay with uh, strong Norwegian hopes in the men's relay, of course. Rudnaya though, here towards the finish. We see actually in the result list we are missing Marika Taini and uh, there might be a problem with the last control. That would be brutal. That would be brutal. We will wait and see. We're going to get confirmation but from that. Then. I don't really remember her when she punched there. Yeah, but you know, you can look like you punch, it's the touch free punching, it's the competitor's responsibility to make sure that the unit type flashes, so we will see. I, I mean, she was still. We'll, we will have to wait, for sure, but at the moment she's not in the result list. I mean, it doesn't affect the medals, but it does affect the podium. Mm -hmm. And will probably affect the podium, so um, yeah. That one, I have a feeling that one might. If it is, uh, I mean, we don't we don't know if it was the last. No, we that don't. That was just uh, speculation. That was speculation. Uh, some information we got, but we don't know. We don't have any confirmation on that. Good night in sixth place. Now looking for Caroline Olsen. Will she go faster than the Russian? And Rudnaya may actually be the, the fastest Russian of today. Faster than Gempela. So Caroline Olsen's familiar bounding style. Really using those arms and those shoulders to get that speed. And um, she will be racing for a spot on the podium. Though she's got to go faster than Hayu and Jakob. And now, now we have Karin Olsson to the finish. Oh, equal fourth. Yeah, that was a very good finish, uh, last part of Karin Olsson. And uh, we also got uh, information that it's confirmed the disqualification or the mispunch, but uh, it looks very strange because it's about the last control and she was there. Yeah, let's uh, have another look here. So we take a look here. It might be a technical issue and she will definitely we will definitely have a uh, protest uh, on the result today. Oh. Yeah, I mean, but she's... She did. In my opinion, she's close enough. This should be... I mean, we have seen other people punching. I remember Olav Lundenes uh, at one control. He was not even touching the control. Uh, in my opinion, she's uh, close enough there. And, uh, well, she will... Oh, we will oh, we'll see a protest and uh, let's see. 
Yeah. And then we have a. She's not happy. She's not very happy. <laughs> no, she could. We could see her storming um, past us uh, to get the download, and uh, she has to be brought back. Make sure they get her GPS. She was able to catch her up into that equal fourth place, um, but. Phew. Here we ah, have Sabine let's Housley. See, though. another one fighting for this fourth position. And I say it looks pretty good. Yeah, that should that should be enough. Fast finish from this Swiss oriented. The four runners still out in the forest behind um, Housley. I mean, uh, Marika Taini was as close as uh, Sabina Hauswirt on his last control, in my opinion. Hauswirt, yes, she will take that fourth spot. Significantly behind the medals, but should be a podium for her. So, fourth place there. Mind you. 26 behind, but me could take so. so uh, Sabina Hauswit had it on her right hand. It's much easier for her to punch the controls, swiping past it with her right hand. Um, Marika Taney's were on her left arm. Like you can see, I'm not sure she got as close, but anyway, whatever. Yeah, and there will we'll almost see. definitely be a. My opinion is there. that she touched the, the control with the arm, and that it that should be as good as uh, holding it over the control. But let's see, that's well, my opinion. TV footage can affect. I mean, um, you the know. thing is also, did she check the light or not? Oh, we see the mistake there by Natalia Kempela. But I mean, she. The question is. Uh, um, um, or not the question, she should control if she has punched or not. Um, but let's see, it's. I. I I don't really see it happen that she will be uh, have a mispunch there, but uh, we will see. Yeah, she's out of the medal, so a flower ceremony will not uh, be affected. And of course, uh, no medals or podium places are awarded today. We wait until those results become official before before that happens. But Gempela, you can see there, um, two minutes behind Olsen. She's the second to last starter. She'll be, I think, very disappointed with her run today. As we saw with uh, Caroline Olsen. Wait out there in the terrain. That's mm. control number 18. Now we are waiting for Natalia Gampele. See that time ticking by. She will be looking now for a top 10 finish. We've also have had Sarah Hagstrom, the last starter, pre warned. And Marianne Anderson has gone through this point, but she's 12 minutes down on the lead. Gempler then into this control. She'll be taking it quite carefully after that miss to control 16. Just at in the control there, mm -hmm. making the route choice decision. You can keep in mind that uh, Marie Katani is out of the result list in this graphics there. And now there's only one runner left to approach this. Uh, 18th control, and that's Sara Hagström from Sweden. But I think we can uh, take a look at the standings at the finish, and uh, once again, the world champion, not for the first time, uh, actually for the fourth time in a row, to Alexandersson. And uh, silver medal, first time, I think, first time top 10 uh, individually uh, getting a silver medal, Lina Strand from Sweden, and a bronze medal to Switzerland, same as in the men's race, Simona Abersolt.
And then fourth place, we don't really know because it was a tight battle between Marie Cantaini and Simon Abersold. So we have to wait and see. Uh, we will definitely get a protest there. Uh, but we have to we have to wait. Yeah, we will have to wait. Of course, those results will be confirmed online. Just have to wait for those. Also, a uh, very good race by Vendela Horchitskova. We haven't been talking about her that much. Czech Republic at the moment in ninth position. Yeah, definitely want to do better than expected. Uh, also, uh, Miritana Erdem in 14th for Denmark as well. Susan Lush in uh, 15th for Germany, quite a good result as well. And Joe Shepard, Great Britain, in 17th at the moment. I know a lot of the um, hopes for a top 20 finish. Now we are waiting for the last starter, Sara Hagström. Still fighting for the top 10 here. Launching in ninth position. Gap is half a minute to Natalia Kempele, and then uh, we don't really know about the result there. Back at the finish, this is Marina Addison. Uh, she was the third last starter. I expected her to be a bit higher up in the result list. Uh, she's very experienced. Uh, I thought that this would be an advantage uh, when it comes to s such extreme route choices. Um, well, I think that she will but more uh, like her goal might be the, the middle distance. I don't, I actually don't know, but I see her as a more, more like a middle distance special, specialist nowadays. And uh, I'm sure she will be back then and fight again for the medals. So fighting here, she's going to be outside of the top 10. So Marin and Anderson into the finish there, 12th place from her. We've just got the news that uh, Marie Cataney's time will be put back. She will be reinstated. Um, no protest needed from the Finnish team. Uh, the organizers decided to put her uh, result back in. <laughs> And now only waiting for Natalia Gempler and Sarah Hagstrom, the last two starters on today's race. And that means that uh, Sarah Hagstrom and Natalia Gempler actually are fighting for the last place in the top 10. Uh, at the moment, we have at the tenth is last TV control, we have uh, Sarah Hagstrom in 10th position and Natalia Gempler in 11th. And it's 30 seconds between the two runners. So we look out at the penultimate control. Here's the Russian. Gempela all the way to the finish now. Just takes that look to her left towards the last control that she's already punched once before. And just checking the map reading, checking she's got it right. All oh, very, very easy to actually make mistakes right at the very end of the course. Gembler here, another one who will be pretty disappointed with her performance, but she will try and defend her title in the middle distance when she won in the very green Latvian forest this time last year. So Gempela in here now to take 10th spot. And then just the last starter side of Hagstrom to contend with. 
good spot there for the Russian from this crowd. But Gempola will not finish as the fastest Russian in the forest. She goes just slower than Rudnaya. Hey, little shake of the head. Not her day today. Happy as always. Well, mm, grim, maybe a grimace. Yeah, but she looks quite happy as always, uh, no matter how the race went. So they were talking about the feeling uh, in the end. Tuve said that she heard already at the arena passage that there's a big gap, so, so she thought it was quite nice that she didn't felt that she didn't feel that she has to push all the way and that she could relax a little bit and uh, calm down in the end. So it was a very good feeling. And well, then Lena started to talk about her race, but we didn't hear <laughs> all, all the way. She was just about to to tell us what she heard when she was passing, but uh, we didn't hear that. Well, thanks to the translation service, as uh, we will see Hagstrand in here now mm -hmm. and uh, let's see it's the fight for the last of the top 10 places but she in fact will be the slowest of the four swedes that we have in the forest so on the women's side at least great day for sweden and i'm sure as we'll see about the rest of this competition Sh that should fight. we be discussing the favorites for the relay now or <laughs> But look, the two teammates here to uh, cheer her in this final section. They know she's got a chance of that top 10 position as Lena Strand and Tova Alexandersson clear. Cheer their Swedish teammate into the finish. Let's see where she ends up. She will go equal ninth there. So into the top 10, pushing Gempler down into 11th. So four Swedish women within the top 10 there. Um, you know, Swedish coaches, Swedish team, Swedish fans uh, feeling great about those results there. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit disappointing by the Swedish men. Uh, I mean, on a high level, of course, but uh, I, I'm expecting, I was expecting them to be performing better, a little bit better, especially Gustav Bergman, who lost a lot of time on the long route. But uh, Swedish women, they really proved uh, how good they are in this Scandinavian terrain. And uh, again, the results, final results. Now, again, with uh, Marika Taini in the result list. So we have Tove Alexandersson, the world champion, again, in the long distance. Then uh, first individual medal for Lina Strand, silver medal, and uh, bronze medal to Switzerland and Simona Abersold. And as we mentioned before, four Swedish runners in the top 10 and uh, three Swiss runners in the top, uh, top 10 as well. So not very many nations here among the top 10. And now uh, we will go and hear some words of uh, Tove Alexandersson, the world champion in the long distance. Well done, Tova. Congratulations. Uh, fourth gold in the long in a row. Was the course what you expected it to be? Uh, no, actually not. It was much more running on the golf track and on yeah, bigger tracks. Not that much in the forest that I had expected, but uh, I'm really satisfied with the race. Of course, you had a great speed out in the forest, but we also saw you execute the route choices really, really well. How did you approach the route choice decisions today? 
Yeah, I really try to look at uh, all the different route choices and choose the best one and take my time and also be really careful to do the route choices in the best way. And then did you get a good feeling when you were out there on the course that you were having a successful race? It's uh, always hard to know but uh, I did a little mistake to the first control but after that I have done a really good race but it was much more used to running than I had expected. I thought it would be more orienteering in the forest. <laughs> And um, you mentioned that really small mistakes, number one, but how were you able to regain your focus after that? Uh, yeah, it was, of course, a little bit stressing, but it was not a big one. So when I had started to do good orienteering again, and uh, I was not so stressed. And it was maybe good because it made me more focused on the orienteering afterwards. And I know that you can do some mistakes if you're not are focused enough. But then I think as you came through the arena, you got the feedback that you were leading with a big margin. Yeah, exactly. So it was really nice to come to the arena and heard that uh, I had so big marginal. So the last loop, I really just tried to be even more careful with the orienteering. And it was, it was so cool to come in the end. And it was a spectator already with the... Uh, second last control that was sharing and telling me that he, I was taking the gold so yeah like, like the last minutes it was uh, just a so good feeling to come to the finish and see all the people sharing for me yeah it was an amazing feeling well congratulations Sweden won two today yeah it's so cool I'm so happy for Lena it's uh, yeah it's amazing to take a double together with her congratulations So uh, let's go through the course again. We have uh, Marika Teini, Tove Alexandersson, Lina Strand and uh, Simona Abersold in the comparison here. The first four spots, uh, we see that both Teini and Strand are going down on the road, which was a quite a good option here in the beginning. Also to get some self-confidence and get used to the map. Of course, very important in the long distance. Uh, and then the first of the two very decisive route choices. Uh, my opinion is that both, I mean, it, it was kind of a decision already early in the race. Uh, Alexanderson, of course, she opened the gap there, but also Lina Strand got really in touch with the medals here in the very beginning by choosing the fastest route. And we see that uh, Simona Abersol and Marie Cateni are choosing different route choices. So actually the four first places are choosing three different route choices. That's quite interesting. Good job by the course planner here. But already here we see it's a big gap between the two Swedish runners and uh, Abersol and Taini. And then from control seven to eight, the second very long leg. And uh, here we have seen an almost perfect uh, to Alexanderson. I was mentioning quite the same. It was almost the same interview as we have heard from uh, Olaf Lundenes when she was um, surprised about uh, that so much of the orienteering was more or less out of the forest and that they went back to the forest and a lot of uh, running on the golf course. Uh, this here, of course, was one part of the forest orienteering for her, and she did it very well. So see that at this point, Marika Teini is actually in front of Lina Strand. So still on the way for a silver medal there. We see that uh, Simona Absolt is quite much behind here, more than a minute, I would guess, or around a minute. Uh, all of them chose the Luna's route choice around there. Even more extreme around than we have seen Olaf Lunas doing. Then the last loop here, the fight for the medals, both the silver medal and the bronze medal between Strand, Taini and Abersold. And uh, Alexanderson, she did quite uh, quite much safety, put quite much safety into her running as we heard her 
saying in the interview. And uh, here you got the feeling that uh, Marika Taini starts to be tired, losing time compared to Lina Strand and also compared to Simona Abersold. But still, Taini in front of uh, Abersold at control 18. Then here in this very last part, Abersold seems to be a little bit quicker. And that uh, in the end there were some seconds in between. So uh, more or less uh, the same situation as in the men's race. I think uh, we had two very decisive uh, route choices. And we have seen many of the top athletes choosing different routes there. So uh, I think that's a good job. That's a good sign for a course planner if you can. Uh, well, you've delivered the... the qualities and their characteristics of a long distance race and played out you know hopefully as they expected well all three athletes here have been really closely looking at that gps tracking uh, could not get a word with tova once i finished the interview she was glued to the screen watching the route choices because you know that analysis that feedback is all part of that uh, same system and um you can see um, they're actually standing you in could, the wrong yeah, order. Yeah, <laughs> I was just about to mention. You see that Lina Strand and uh, Simona Abrasol are not that experienced on, <laughs> <laughs> on the podium. <laughs> yeah. So oh, there is. we go. <laughs> Lina Strand gets upgraded and medal. Yeah. But as you mentioned, actually, it's her first top ten individual results, yeah. and then she gets a silver medal. That's a very impressive. But it's. Uh, I had a bit the same feeling as I have with, uh, sometimes with Gustav Berryman. Uh, great shape during the spring and uh, so much potential, but uh, then when it really counted, uh, she never got this race that was really going all the way. But let's yeah. talk about Simona Abersold, her first ever walk I mean final, taking the bronze medal. It's, of course, uh, it's a she's a little bit standing in the shadow of Casper Foster today, but yeah. otherwise, I mean, she's a first-year senior. That's um, first walk race. Other runners are so nervous. Uh, also, I mean, she knows that she can be up there. She won a, a medal at the European Champs, and then you just deliver the race and get the medal. That's impressive. Second place silver medalist she will be when the results are confirmed. Lena Strand taking the flowers there. And another similarity to the men's men's race, one, two for Norway in this women's race, one, two for Sweden. And the uh, third to Switzerland. Exactly. And uh, another similarity, it's uh, the dominance of one runner in the discipline. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, everything we said about uh, loneliness is, is also counting for Alexander. Just the fact that in the men's cat, like, Luna is clearly the best uh, long-distance runner, uh, in my opinion, in, in among the men, but uh, in the women's you had uh, uh, Simone Nikli, and, uh, well, she has so many gold medals, it's hard to, to say that she, the two is the best uh, of all time. Yes, but, well, you have Hova to. is uh, only part way through her orienteering career. Of course. So let's uh, these a recap of how the top three managed to take it. Simona Abersold and, and, and really Lena Strand, uh, comparatively, both coming from quite an early start time. Uh, I mean, not, not early in the whole start list, but compared to you know those top 10 runners, compared to Alexanderson, Lena Strand taking that second. And this is Alexanderson through the arena run through. She knew at this point that she'd got enough of a gap she was able to kind of back off back down at that point and that's you can see really what it means to her Alexanderson four gold medals in the long distance in a row yeah. so let's have a look at these uh, results at the finish with everyone into the finish Alexanderson a huge lead in the end it was only uh, Marika Taney only lost a medal by 12 seconds. Van Lahaliu and Carolyn Olsen will share, it looks like, 
that uh, last spot on the podium. Carolyn Olsen managing to pick up a fair few places in the end. Natalia Gempler is one who will be disappointed, but look out for Vandula Hotichkova in to, you know, the Czech runner in 12th. That's a great result from her. Camilla Olausen has been one that people have been talking about as well. Certainly I've been talking about her as one to watch. She um, finished lower down than maybe she expected. Um, we'll have something to fight for, I think, on that middle distance uh, on Friday. And we can, of course, look down uh, the rest of the results with 70 women taking that. So we're going to leave you with some pictures from today's competition. It was uh, two golds to Norway, two medals to Norway, two medals for Sweden, two medals for Switzerland. And today we'll be back for the middle distance final on Friday. We will see you then.